together, you know, takes time for me too. So I understand it's a painful process, but it's the only way to learn and it's the only way to really pick up on, on these tools, okay? And so the only way to do it, and what I've seen has definitely helped a couple of the students is, um, and I think at least three of you I've seen kind of sit with your laptops as I'm working and you're working, and then they're sending me spreadsheets along the way saying, hey, I got stuck with this. I did all of that, but I got stuck when I got to the data table. Take a look at it. And I, I'm happy to do that. You know, sometimes it's, Excel's really important. It's really small little things sometimes trip you up. Uh, and so if you work along, if you're, if you're working along as you're listening, instead of doing stuff like playing chess or you know, driving or whatever, uh, then you, I'm sorry, I, I, I had to throw that one out. It, you, know, you really do pick it up, okay? So uh, that's my encouragement, okay? Uh, a couple of just suggestions on things. Uh, don't, don't get lazy on losing, so as we build up, don't forget the things we learned. So we worked on formatting a lot the first week. Don't forget formatting the second week. Don't just like, oh, I'm just going to focus on the formulas this week, right? You know, we're trying to build. So incorporate the formatting. Incorporate the, 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 the tools. Incorporate the time, value, and money concepts, right? You know, we're going to overlay leverage next, right? So, so keep building. And don't forget, don't get lazy and go back to your old ways. And you guys see me work. I, it's like kind of like an obsessive compulsive thing. You see me stop. I see something and I go back and fix it. It's the only way to get a spreadsheet to look, hello? Uh, it's the only way to get things to work. So um, the other thing that's really important is to think through what you want to accomplish. Because when you start doing things like working with data tables, goal seek, solver, if the plumbing doesn't work, right, if the flow's not there, it's not going to work. So if if this formula doesn't rely on this variable multiplied by that variable multiplied by that variable, you can't do a data table pointing to a variable and hoping that this changes, right? So it's kind of like, you know, the, the hip bones connected to the knee bone or whatever. It excels the same way. The plumbing's got to work if you want the tools to work. If you hard code numbers, if you code numbers into cells, then it doesn't work, right? So you can't take the shortcut, right? So if, if you're going to grow something by a percentage, set an assumption of percentages and then point to it. And in that way, now that becomes a variable that you can play with, okay? So don't forget the flow. The flow is very important, okay? So um, I just wanted to mention that. Now, um, tenure treasuries, tenure treasuries, I, I ask all the time, when the more precise? 1.716, maybe? Could it be the 1.716? Okay, we should all know that. We should all be looking at that. Okay, is it up or down from last week? Yeah. Down by how much? Nine basis points. Were there any other changes in interest rates this week? Did the term structure change? The Fed rate. The, what did the Fed move? Who, who's the Fed? The Federal Reserve. What is the Federal Reserve? The fund rate. It's a what? The Federal Reserve fund rate was a... Uh, okay, but what is the control Federal the money Reserve, Reserve supply? Right? Yeah, the centralized money supply. The centralized money, I mean... Like the overseers of, of the U.S.'s money is the trade. The overseer of the U.S.'s money. Let's be... What is... Right? Like, is that term. not true? There's a specific term. It's a central bank gotcha. of the United States. Who owns <laughs> the Federal Reserve? The Federal right. Reserve. It's a separate entity. The, government. the U.S. Right. government. Unknown bank. The Federal Reserve. So the Federal Reserve comes into existence when? 1913, 1914, 1914. 1913. And why does it come into effect in 1913? No, no. That's the next one. What did they do? Jekyll Island? What did they do there? You mean they got together there? Okay. I, but why did they do that? Because there was too many uh, 
counterfeit currencies going around. No, no. Wait, try to no, 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 You're just guessing. Don't speak unless you know the answer. is 1929. <laughs> so you're off 16 years. <laughs> That's very good, actually. The 16th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. How the hell do you know that? <laughs> So, so in 1913, a lot of stuff happens. Who was president in 1913? Woodrow Wilson. Wilson. Wilson was the president. And what was happening in the world in 1913? Well, that is a precursor to that. There's civil war. Isn't that the Spanish American War? Where are you from, Brazil? Oh my God. Holy God. Maybe there was a civil war in Brazil that I don't know. I don't even think there's ever been a civil war in Brazil, has there been? Okay, so look, it's a precursor. 1913, there's a lot of funky stuff going on in the world. There's a lot of stuff going on in the world. Um, you've, got, you've got the whole industrialization happening. Isabel, the whole industrialization is happening, okay? And with all that, the economies are changing. So we're going from agrarian economies to industrialized economies, people leaving the, 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 the country, coming to cities. Uh, uh, people are concentrating tremendous amounts of wealth, right? Um, there are people that are struggling. Unions start popping up. What starts happening in 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 in, in, uh, in Europe that leads up to the war? There's all kinds of like weird movements coming out of like the UK, right? The Leon, Tr I mean the, the the USSR, Russia, the Leon Trotskys of the world, right? You got you got. You know, the whole Friedrich Engels, the whole theory of communism and socialism and the proletariat. And in this country, you start getting uh, a big rise in labor unions, right? so all kinds Bless of stuff you. going on. And, and part of what leads to the problem of the creation of the Central Bank in 1913, and, and there's a big run on banks at some point around 1910. And they got, there's no central bank. There is no bank for the banks. Every bank is its own institution, right? And so, um, there was a guy named John Pierpont uh, Morgan, J JP Morgan, who was the biggest of the bankers, and he kind of backstopped all these banks. And as a result of that, a bunch of bankers got together and said, hey, something needs to be done here. And so there was legislation enacted, and the U.S. created its central bank, right? It's called the Federal Reserve Bank. And who owns that bank? The, the, the member banks. It's owned by the bank. So what does a central bank do? In this country, so so it is the bank for all the banks. That is one thing that it is. It is the bank for all the banks. Cole, you had a thought. Fights, fights inflation. Okay, so let's leave this other mandate out here. Let's sort of talk about what they do. There's two basic functions that that the uh, that the Fed does is it it, uh, it is the bank for all the banks. And as a result of that, what it does is it facilitates the payment system in this country, right? So how do you pay without having a clearinghouse, right? If I have a check drawn on your bank, how do, how do I deposit it in yours or whatever? What's how a clearinghouse? So, What's a clearinghouse? A clearinghouse is like what it sounds like. You send something here to clear. So I'm in bank A, right? And let's say that there are three banks, right? Okay? I want to pick up my boat on Wednesday. I wrote them a check drawn on the credit union, right? Mm -hmm. well, they went to their bank and they sent it up to the Federal Reserve Branch here in Miami and that branch went and took it out of my account and credited it to them. Gotcha. Okay, so that's what a clearinghouse is. And now you've got clearinghouse airline tickets, you know, some of them, it's a little bit different now because that's all sort of electronic, but it used to be the tickets were physical tickets and so, you, you know, you could, have a ticket on American and fly on United. Yes, Sam. So just to understand, the Federal Reserve was a detergent for spread of communism. In no, the no, no, no. I said there's a lot of stuff going yeah, on in 1913. Okay. okay, and it's impacting economies. It's impacting workforces. One of the options that we get in this country, right, is there's a big run on banks and, and the, you know, precursor to this time frame. What, and that's what people. And it wasn't the first time there'd been a run on banks. Okay, and so. That's when they said, look, we need to have something that kind of regulates, right? So it does provide regulation. Uh, yes, sir? Wasn't there other central banks? Isn't this the fourth one that was that finally, like there was three other ones that failed? So I, 
um, you, you may know more than I know, okay? And I don't know that there were any specific true... It wasn't the first time it was trying to be implemented. Like okay. Finance. You know what? Why don't you do some research on that and bring it to us next time? I was just curious on your opinion. Like, because I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I know that the, the current bank that we have comes from 1913, and I know that we did not have a formal bank before. There were banks that attempted to people like J.P. Morgan functioned as as central banks, but they weren't the central bank. Do you feel it's necessary? 100. percent Do I think it's necessary to have a central bank today? Mm -hmm. Um, probably, and and even if you look at a worldwide level, there's something called the BIS. What is that? The Bank of International Settlements. Because just like if you write a check to, or if you want to send a wire, you've heard of SWIFT. Like if you want to send a wire, or IBAN. If you want to send a wire to a bank in Europe, or somebody wants to send you money from Europe, you need a clearinghouse. And so the Bank of International Settlements is kind of an overseer where all of the central banks, and when you hear things like Basel I, Basel II, Basel III, which are worldwide banking initiatives to provide regulations, minimum capital requirements for banks, et cetera, it's all coming out of the Bank of International Settlements, okay? So there is a central bank for all the central banks. If for no other reason, let's, we, I haven't gotten to what we all think about the Fed, if for no other reason that there needs to be a clearinghouse and something that facilitates the process of payments, then we probably need one. Now, if you want to think in a world of cryptocurrencies yeah. and all like, that kind of stuff, well, like that. yeah, but but there still needs somebody needs to do the clearinghouse function. Or to, you can call it whatever you want to call it. Isabel, please. Uh, there needs to be a clearinghouse. You could call it whatever. You call it Globex or whatever you know the clearinghouse is for all of these cryptocurrencies. But but somebody's got to facilitate that flow. Otherwise, we're right back into a primary economy, right? Where I take a cow or I take you milk and you give me a chicken or eggs or whatever. Okay. <laughs> so I mean, I, I mean that's a whole other class on on markets. You know why markets bring efficiency into economies. Okay. But yeah, I think we need something. Now, in this particular country, the Fed's been given two other uh, uh, mandates, which is uh, uh, price stability and full employment. So it, it, it is meant to provide or institute policies that, that foment or support price stability, i.e. low inflation, or two, um, have full employment or as close to full employment as possible. How does it do that? How does it do that? Sorry? Through the interest rate. Well, so it, it attempts to it attempts to set monetary policy. Okay, interest rates, controlling interest rates is a way of controlling monetary policy. So, for example, you could say uh, the economy is getting hot. People are investing too much. So let's raise interest rates so that it becomes more costly to borrow, people will borrow less, invest less, and cool down the economy. That's one theory. But there's another way to accomplish the same end. The banks control, the central bank controls the deposits of these banks. So it could change the deposit requirement. It could say to the member banks, you need to keep 20% of your assets on deposit with me. So essentially it takes out their ability to loan. So it could constrict or expand the money supply. So that's another way to do that. Um, and, and what it really does try to do is, is to try to stimulate or, or control price, you know, to create the price stability through interest rates movements. Now, I'm not going to get into this. I, I wasn't even going to talk. I didn't prepare for any of this stuff. This stuff is like, you know, just kind of in the back of the mind. Um, um, there is, um, there is, we talked about the term structure of interest rates, where, where we could put um, um, risk and return, right? And sorry, time to return, right? So we've talked about upwardly sloping interest rates and and, and flat and and uh, uh, sort of inverted yield curves and 
pumped. Okay, there's a lot of different theories that explain. I talked about this in one of the earlier videos. There's a lot of different ways to take a look. But when we talk about the term structure of interest rates, we talk about what's the return profile over a series of time. And in a growing economy, you typically have interest rates that are lower, right, because of instability or uncertainty, right? The more time you have, the more uncertainty you have. So it, it would hold logic that in normal times, to borrow money for a year should cost you less than to borrow money for 10 years, because 10 years brings uncertainty, okay? Now, you can also do the same thing and take a look at, take a look at sort of a term structure of risk, Kenny. And so um, we can look at return and we can compare it to risk, okay? And so when you do that, you can kind of plot and you can see that given the amount of risk, you typically, I, I mean, I, I'll show you, when I pop up the computer, I'll show you a slide that I used to do in one of my classes where you definitely can see that um, the riskier an investment, the more return that the market, the market prices into it. And this is empirical evidence that I accumulate. I mean, you, you can see it. You can go to the Wall Street Journal and look at different interest rates, and you can see for yourself that the greater the risk, the higher the return. Um, the argument here, going back to why I brought all this up, is, is, is the argument theory, in theory, is, is that the Fed's fund rate is really the baseline interest rate in this country that sets all of the other rates. That's the theory. Um, um, the real practice is, the real practice is the Fed funds rate is really market driven, okay? The, so what is the Fed funds rate? It's with the banks, like the interest at which they borrow money from the Fed. The no, that's the discount rate. So, so, so the, the Fed, if a member bank needs money, the Fed will loan the member banks money. It will loan them money at the discount rate. So they say, well, then the discount rate should really be the baseline. The problem is nobody borrows at the discount window. Why? If a bank has to go to the discount window to borrow money, they would say money. that that bank's not in good shape. So, so banks don't go to the discount window unless they're in a really bad way. Okay, they're about to be intervened. Um, so the Fed funds rate is the bank is the rate at which banks loan to one another. So they typically highly secured. So they'll you know a lot of these like overnight agreements secured by. Treasury bills, you've heard of overnight repos and things like that. So the Fed funds rate is the rate at which banks loan to one another, okay? Um, and the way the Fed sort of creates that or influences that rate is by affecting liquidity, right? So, um, you know, ultimately what they do what are called open market operations. You've heard of quantitative easing? Yes, sir. That's, that's a huge, huge open market operation. It means that the Fed goes into the market and either buys securities or sells securities, right? If all of a sudden you dump a bunch of securities into the market, right? What happens? The price goes down, right? If price goes down, what goes what happens with yield? It goes up. If all of a sudden the Fed goes into the market and buys a lot of securities, right? They soak up a lot of the men. They push the price up and what happens to the yield? It goes down. So the way that they affect interest rate is through open market operations, okay? Um, one last thing that I'm going to throw in, because I'm going to bring the topic up in a, in a second. Um, we've heard, and, and this is a rate that's used quite a lot as a benchmark in real estate, it's LIBOR. What is LIBOR? London, London Inter International Bank Rate, something the like that. The London Interbank offered rate, which is different Close. than HIBOR. <laughs> HIBOR, the Hialeah yeah. Interbank <laughs> offered, no. LIBOR is a London Interbank offered rate, and LIBOR is nothing, nothing different than the Fed's funds rate in London. It's the rate at which banks loan to one another in London, okay? And London is a money center in the world, it's a very competitive market, it's a, a very competitive market that attracts deposits, and as a result or as a consequence to that, it has very competitive or very low rates, okay? Now, somebody had a question, Kenny. No, I was gonna say, doesn't uh, quantitative easing and the process of that also increase and decrease the money supply? I'm 
Um, it definitely creates liquidity in member banks, right? Because at the end of the day, who buys securities? Uh, you're asking me a question that I'm not an economist, Kenny, so I can't answer that question, okay? Because I forget that, I forget, I forget money supply is like a, a formula, okay? It's, it has to and there's the different, money and there's different money supplies. There's M1, there's different ways of measuring money, right? So there's M1, it's like if I look at my wallet, right? What's money? Your cash, your credit, your checking. Hold on, well just look at my wallet. Is, is this money? Can I see it closer up? Is this money? Is this money? It's money though, isn't it? It's money, right? Yeah, 50. Is this money? It can be, yeah. So it is money, right? So. I will use. Is this money? <laughs> Depends if you have an app. I don't. I don't. I, it's not money. It's not money for me. But for some people, it is money. Yeah, right? Money. And so, and so, so the definitions of money are varied and they're changing. And so, I don't. I don't know. You know your specific answer. But what I can tell you, what I do know that is what impacts is is treasury. Treasury not So banks. Banks are very limited in what they can do because of the depression. In this country, banks can only... What do commercial banks do in this country? Lend. Commercial lend. banks lend. They do two things. And take deposits. They do what? They lend. And take they take deposits first, right? So they take deposits and they... Lend. Loan money. What can they make investments in? Low risk. Low risk. Uh, High investments. security. They can only make investments in loans. So they can make loans. And they can buy treasuries. Can they buy real estate? No. No. They, the only real estate a bank can own is is their own branch operator. You know, their own branch and operating facility. Why so, is, that? is that? Because because it, there was a big depression in this country, and like everybody lost all their money, and so as a result, there's something called the FDIC, which which backstops deposits. And what it does is it creates. There's a lot of regulation that prohibits banks from assuming. I mean, you're getting into like the Glass Eagle Act. Well, and stuff. just to understand, like they don't let them invest in real estate because if something happens, real estate's too risky. And the idea is that these people come to cash in on their deposits, and they don't have the money available because the real estate investment took a turn. That's a problem. And, and leverage factor. Well, it's not even leverage and all. It's 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 a concept of speculation, and it's the concept. There's also an issue of. I mean, I'm not a banker, right? But you've got maturity risk in a bank, right? And so. If you're making investments in non-liquid assets, mm -hmm. you may have issues vis-a-vis -vis your liabilities. And understand that a bank deposits are their liabilities, not their assets, right? So, so they want to make sure that there's moneyness, there's liquidity in the investments that they make. There's something which is not defunct, which is so there's a whole other sort of push in 1933 and 34. There's a series of, of legislation that reacts to the depression that, that Sam was talking about. So, you know, we've talked about the Securities and Exchange Acts of 33 and 34. There was something called the Glass-Steagall Act, which was, there's something called the Financial Services Modernization Act of 1999, which pretty much killed this. But the Glass-Steagall Act essentially took banking or financial services, financial intermediary operations, and broke them into three different things. And so it said insurance companies can only function as insurance companies. Commercial banks can only function as commercial banks. And investment banks, right, can only function as investment banks. And you can't do one or another because of the risk associated with each one of the activities, right? And ultimately, this one, which is what safeguarded the deposits of all of the citizens, was backstopped by the FDIC, right? So the FDIC is insurance that's paid for by the member banks, but it's backstopped by the U.S. government. So. You know, you get all the banking regulation that says, hey, if we're going to backstop the insurance fund for the commercial banks, then we need to make sure that what you're doing is safe and sound. And that's why bank regulators go, you know, to banks on a recurring basis, okay? Now, then they created something called bank holding companies, and then, you know, the lines started getting blurred here. You could actually do this as long as it was a holding company and there were firewalls between these operations. But... This was when Citibank and Travelers merged, and it basically just kind of did. So 
and most companies have a bank holding company, um, but you know a lot of these financial services firms are fully integrated, right? So Bank of America owns Merrill Lynch, right? Uh, Goldman Sachs is now a bank holding company and it has an investment bank, but essentially has a commercial bank. Who wasn't it? You sent me some deposits that they were. Yeah, Marcus or something. Some, yeah, yeah. Some guy named Marcus. Who's Marcus? Marcus. Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs. It's Goldman Sachs, right? And so, and and whose whose credit card is the Apple credit card? Goldman Sachs. It's Goldman Sachs. So, so all these lines are now blurred. Okay. So anyway, uh, so is that a nice little sidetrack? No. Is it interesting? Yes. I, mean, I enjoyed it. The quiz. It's not on the quiz. There's no quiz today. If you read my email, I know, there's, there's no quiz. There's no quiz today. So. <laughs> oh, I did not read. Uh, just a couple of things to just a couple of things to, to mention. I I thought about I, I cut this out from I cut this out from a newspaper in Spain last Sunday and I thought of Sam because he's Danish and it it's a whole thing on I'm not gonna read I can't even read this with my I'd have to get like a telescope. But um, there's a whole article. This is from the Daily in Barcelona and it says that um, so there's a whole issue on rent control you know, taking focus in, in the political dialogue, and there's elections going on there now. And in particular, the, the other article says that Denmark is looking for formulas or ways to stop Blackstone, because Blackstone has raised, I don't know how many funds for housing in Denmark, and it's taken such a control on the available, you know, rental stock, you know, and then obviously people are concerned, you know, that it's all speculative money and, and, and uh, you know, it's impacting rent. So. And that's a problem we're not going to solve in this class, um, but there's definitely a whole issue of affordability and housing is something that's going to dominate. And I, you know, so um, just a couple of other things. I talked about data centers earlier. Digital Realty DL DLR is one of the largest publicly traded um, um, data center REITs in this country. And they're buying an operation in Europe for eight billion dollars. I thought the next thing is SBA Communications, which is a tower company, is buying a 900 tower portfolio in South Africa. And what do I, when I see these things, what does that tell me? What did we talk about international investing last week? It's not as we talked about risk. We right. talked about risk and local uncertainty. Partnerships. But if people are doing this, what 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 are the implications of that? They're not finding returns here, so they're seeing, or they can find higher returns elsewhere, or or you know so. Yeah, you know, here's the not, next one. So here's the next one. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this uh, industrial in a second. Prologis, Prologis is buying whom? <laughs> Different <laughs> asset, office industrial. Prologis, industrial. So they, they made an announcement this week that they're buying Liberty Property Trust for $12 billion. Interesting. So, um, so it says, between Prologis and Blackstone, there was an article in last Saturday's journal about Blackstone going on a whole side. They've got a, an $800 million fund just on what they call last mile. That's the big you know, buzzword now, last mile. And it's one of the things that I, I sort of had here. It's uh, in 20 cities now, Amazon is offering two-hour grocery delivery. Yeah. delivery. Yeah. So people just keep talking about you know, last mile. It's, Curious thing. Um, I, I had a conversation, which I'm going to reference in a second, to, with somebody yesterday, and they were telling me that um, they they heard um, Hamid is the CEO of of of, of Prologis, and he was talking about that they're redoing leases, so their leasing spread on industrial assets today in certain markets is almost 30%, meaning leases expiring for people to renew in the space they're at, they're having to pay 30% more. And the market's holding that. That's how hot the industrial sector is right now. We'll talk a little bit about industrial, because I want you, you know, we'll talk about office another day, we'll talk about retail another day. Yes, Jacqueline? Well, that, they were also talking about like a new typology. Last week we were talking about the footprint of a warehouse. Now they're going vertically with warehouses because they can, they need to be, because of the one day or one hour or whatever delivery, they need to be closer to the urban centers instead of sprawling out in. Yeah, and, and in particular, um, it's kind of interesting, in the spring there was an article, Prologis is now building 
um, three-level warehouses in certain key markets. And, and the, the only thing I could think about when I saw that was, it was kind of like back to the future. How, how was, how were warehouses at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, right? If you go to New York and Boston, weren't they all sort of like in the middle of the cities, fully, you know, vertically, you know, vertically? And so you just had these huge, you know, elevators in the middle of it, and you needed to get the product close to where the people were, and, and we kind of seem to be going back there. There's a trade-off there, Jack, and I, I, I've, run a, I've, I've run several warehouse operations in my life, not as a, like a real estate guy, but like as an operator. Um, there's a trade-off between efficiency and volume, right? So uh, uh, what's not common in South Florida, we're building industrial boxes up to about 32 feet, something like that. Uh, and maybe, may, maybe an easier way to give you this example is, if you guys have ever been to like these boat yards where the boats are vertically stacked? Yeah. Have you seen how slow those guys move? They've got very precious cargo, right? And they're moving these very expensive boats very high up and in their very tight quarters. They move very, very slow, right? Well, I can tell you when you're like in a stand-up forklift and you got a 2,500 pound pallet and you're taking it up three feet, four feet to a second level, that's pretty easy. When you take that tower up three levels, and that thing's 24 feet above you, and you're sort of leaning yeah. forward, and there's very precious cargo in there, uh, you don't move that fast. And so the whole picking and packing becomes a little bit more complicated too. So yes, it's kind of strange that in real estate we, we rent space on a two-dimensional level, square footage, but especially in industrial space, we really take advantage of the volume, and we've never charged for volume. So yeah, the higher the better in a certain way, but in another way, it does create certain inefficiencies, and, and the cost of the equipment is that much more complicated. Yes, Kenny? Yeah, I've read that article, but that was like about like six months ago, where they're changing even the design of warehouses, where they're adding in uh, parking lots where they, they can have trucks drive on well, and back up and actually load through the parking lot. Right. So there's a separation between so, the warehouse and trucking area. Well, I, I, I really, uh, Ken, I, we've got architects in this class that can draw this a lot better than I can, okay? But so you and me both. I can tell you, I can tell you that, let, let's see if, if I can make this work, right? If, if you look at a 1970s vintage industrial product in South Florida, for example, uh, and South Florida has historically been a small business community, okay? They were all, you know, sort of very traditional, um, front-loaded, you know, small bay type products. So these things were, if we looked at at a cross-section, right, these things were probably 12 to no more than um, 16 feet high, okay? They were typically at grade, okay? They were typically at grade, at street level, no okay? Foundation? No foundation thickness or anything? To well, the, I mean, there is a foundation, but but the, the, the truck cork pulled right in, okay? Okay. And that's, you, you ever see trucks with lift gates? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why do you think you have lift gates? Because people have to put pallets on them, right? You get the pallet jack, you put yeah. the stuff to the end. I mean, that's how I grew up driving a delivery truck, you know? And then you got to bring the stuff down, right? And then, then you got to get the pallet jack, and you pull it in, and you figure out what you do with it inside. But again, very sort of primary and all that. So, but it tended to be you have a, you know, industrial has what, like a 10% office component? Very small component typically, you know, by, so we can, we can draw these conclusions, right? So you would have your office here and then next to it you'd have the industrial, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the overhead, right? And then the truck would, would, would pull in. Uh, and go to Miami International Airport. On the other side of 826, you've got a PS park that's, I forget what it's called now, the Tisch family started building that. They got 200 acres of this kind of product there, okay? Now, in the 1980s in South Florida, so what happened is the Tisch is owned there, so MIA is here, this is north, this is 826, right? MIA is here, and um, so the Tisch family owned this whole section of land. So they developed what Post owns this now, um, or PS Industrial Parks, okay? And uh, they did a joint venture with my old boss on this part, and that's what is now called Beacon Center. 
which is owned by Prologis now. And that was the first attempt here now to change the way that you see industrial days all over the country here in South Florida. And so what you typically look, if you look at a cross section, right, okay, you've got, you've got a recessed truck court in the back. So a truck now can pull in, right? So you, your grade in the front where the office is, right? And you've got a recessed truck cord in the back so the truck can back in, and now the, the forklift can drive straight into it, okay? And so taking your comment a little bit further, if you stop to think, what did we say a truck weighed the other day? 48,000. Well, they, they carry you know, a single trailer is like 40,000. The, the duffels are going to carry probably 60,000. Imagine taking a 40,000 pound truck onto a second level of an industrial building, right? So if you're going to have trucks going up and you're going to have recessed bays there, I mean, you're pouring tremendous amounts of you know, money into concrete. Now, why are they doing all that? Why are they going up? Going back to the volume conversation that we just had. This is scarcity of uh, land. Land and, 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 and the cost, right? Zoning. What, what, what did we say? Let's do the math because we're going to do it now so that we apply these concepts. What did we say coverage was in industrial last week? Do you remember? Coverage and what else? What is the Coverage. So you got X acres of land and you're building industrial product. How much can you cover? Hmm. Okay, that's that's one option. We're looking at me like, hmm. Isabel, any idea? It's coming. <laughs> it's coming. Is it go coming up or down? It's coming up. So you think we cover more than 50%? We did the math here last week, guys. Uh, we said we said that if we had a an acre of land, right? How much could we cover for an industrial product once we accounted for parking and green space and setbacks and retention? I remember fifty max. So um, so there was an interesting newsletter I got. So this is where I get excited, right? I see stuff and I and I I got to call people. Okay, so I get I get all kinds of newsletters every day. We gotta know what's going on in the market. Okay, so um, I I get for for real estate I get two, but there's some other ones out there. I go to a place called Smart Brief, SmartBrief.com. So Smart Brief these people publish like 300 different newsletters. Okay. And they typically do it with industry groups. They do one with NARI, and they do a daily one. I get that one. They're all free, okay? There's one with ICSC, the International Shopping Center, ICE, International Council of Shopping Centers. So that's a retail one. I get that one. I get one from the AICPA, and I used to get one from the Chartered Financial Institute. I stopped getting that because it was just too, too, too much stuff. But there's some related to the construction industry. And what these people do is, is they scour, you know, all sorts of stuff, all sorts of, you know, information, and they'll send you a daily newsletter. You can sign up to stuff like The Real Deal, uh, uh, Globe Street. There's one that I've been getting lately, which is where this has come. It's called Connect Real Estate. I don't know how I got on it, but somehow I got on it, and I get all kinds of newsletters, and they're really good. Okay, so but the real deal, Globe Street, and I use the NARI and the ICSC one, and those give me a pretty broad, you know, plus when you, you're reading the newspapers and all that, you get a pretty broad reach, okay? Um, so I get a thing that says Foundry Commercial acquires 18 acre industrial development site in Miami. Who's Foundry? Does anybody know who Foundry is? Yes, sir. That's a, uh, I don't know how big they are, but I know that they're, uh, Smaller than Collier. In a bread box? No, what? They're, Sorry? they're smaller than what? They're smaller than Collier. Um, but they're a brokerage house, development, construction, they're all of that. Okay, so Foundry is a firm that I don't know a lot about. The Foundry comes out of the old. I think they were called CBL. It was, they come out of an old brokerage and development business that, that was spun off. Um, they are primarily developers. 
okay? And they've got multiple offices, and they're actually not that small, okay? They, they bought the old asset I used to run, the, the, the trade zone. So I thought this was interesting. It says, Foundry Commercial acquires an 18-acre industrial site. So what's my first question when I read this? Who's Foundry? No, I know who Foundry is. The guy I bought it used to be my boss. I, I know who these guys are. What's the next question? They buy eight. How much did they pay for the land? So what do I do? Well, first thing I want was to the property record to see if it closed yet, right? <laughs> hasn't closed yet, or well, it's closed, but it has it's not recorded. So, I, so the next thing I did is I got on the phone. So I called some guys I know they got land right next to this. So I said, Ralph, how much did they pay for it? Oh, they closed on it. So I, I, could, I, I could get it. At the end of the day, we could get it. But I could triangulate to it. What did we say industrial land was worth the other day? Like $25. $10 to $12 a square foot. I think you said 25 Yeah, I, I think, Brian, I think we're probably closer to 20 to 25 And And Ramon, you, you threw a number out. You said a million to an acre or something like that? A million an acre. Okay, so we've got those frames of reference. So what I did is, is I actually went to the parcels. So this is an off-market transaction, right? I couldn't call the broker. I could call the broker. It was Wayne Schutz and David Spillers. I could call those guys. I don't know if they'd share it with me or not. But it's off-market. They knew the owners of the land, and they started shopping it around. There were two separate parcels. One of the parcels had been owned forever, but one of them was bought in 2016 and they paid $11 for it in 2016. So I'm already a little bit above that number three years ago. Then just on a parcel north of there, Duke just bought three industrial buildings that another developer called Bridge out of Chicago built. Mm -hmm. So in 2017, now this is all public record, so you can get all this stuff, right? You can go to the real deal, right? You can go to South Florida Business Journal, so you can actually just go onto the property records and see this, right? So Duke buys 600,000 square feet of industrial product, okay? Duke is a large industrial REIT, and they paid how much for this? Any idea? No? No idea. They paid roughly $120 a square foot for this. Now, the problem is two of the buildings are vacant, so you got to you got to you got to throw in there leasing commissions, first generation leasing commission, and TI. Okay, so they're really in at about $135 a square foot. Okay, for this asset. Okay, now a site that I acquired some years ago sold earlier this year. They sold a 10-acre parcel for $30 a square foot land, okay? So when I start looking at this, and I think, well, how much, are, how much is construction? How much is construction of a box? I got a construction guy here, I'm looking at you. 140 a foot. Well, X land. You still think 140? No. So I, I called yesterday, I called, I called guys that are doing this kind of product, and what did they tell me? A box, a box is going to cost you about $60 a square foot today. Just plain box. Now you got to add all your soft costs, you got to add all your leasing commission, and your first generation TI. They told me use $100 a square foot as a base for doing building an industrial box, X land in Miami. And that's assuming that there's no special conditions on the land, okay? So, these guys buy 18 acres, okay? They can build 320,000 square feet. It's entitled for 320,000 square feet. What's the coverage on that? 50%. I did the math for you already. It's 41%. Okay? So, Whatever they're buying the land for, right, divided by 0 0.4 to, to get, figure out what you got to add to this. So let's use $20 a square foot just to be safe. $20 a square foot at 0 0.41. It's going to be about 50. So how do I convert land feet to building feet? I got to buy 18 acres, but I only get to use... Eight of them. You guys have a blank look on your face. 
Does this make sense? You want me to repeat that? Territory for us. It's what? It's uncharted territory for us. Okay, but, but we're, we're, we're repeating it every week, so we start thinking this way. I buy 18 acres, but it's not all usable, right? So, so if I pay for 18 acres of land, how much can I build? 320, yes, sir. No, I'm just thinking. No, just no. don't think anymore. 20 divided by 0.41. It, it, there's no... 40, 40, so $50 a square foot. Okay? So it looks like they've probably paid, knowing, knowing the guys at Farmery, knowing my old boss, he probably paid more than that for this because there's never, there's no deal that, there's no deal that he would ever give up. It doesn't matter what the price is. He'll figure, he's great. He loves pushing Excel sheets and, and making deals look good on paper, okay? So let's say that from 11, we got to 20. Even though a mile away, land just sold for 30. Okay, let's just be conservative. And I got a guy that's building across the street from these guys that's telling me it's costing $100 a square foot. So it looks like these guys just bought 18 acres, 18 acres, okay, and I'm going to build 320,000 square feet, and it's going to cost them about $150 right now. 320,000 square feet at $100 a square foot is how much? Do you have a gun calculator? Yeah. Thirty-two. Okay, thirty-two million. How much do you think that they paid for the land? That's twenty bucks. Twenty bucks times forty-three thousand dollars, or forty-three thousand square feet is about a million bucks an acre, right? Eighteen acres, about eighteen million dollars. So it looks like this is a fifty million dollar project, right? Right. Okay, does it make sense for them to do this? What's the question we got left to ask? Isabel, yes, what are you going to do? You, you just paid $50 million for this. What are you going to do with it? Find out what the cash flows are per year. Okay, what, what are they? <laughs> okay, do we, know what the, do we know what the industrial market is like in Dade County, Brian? Yes. 9 to 13, or do we say Do we know how big the industrial market is in Dade County? Do we know what sub-market this is in? We don't know any of that. The industrial market in Dade County is about 200 million square feet, depending on who you talk to. Do we know what the occupancy is in industrial in Dade County? So that's the first question. I mean, this all ties back to the, to the reading today, right? What are macro trends, right? What, what, does this make sense? Yeah. Okay, so so my question to you is, is does it make sense for me to buy 18 acres to build another 320,000 square feet? No? You don't think so. But there's 200 million. No, you just went like this. You just, okay, but it's okay. That's why it's a free country. We can all make that decision. So are we flooding the market by putting 320,000 square feet? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. Well, if we know it's 200 million square feet, what's 300,000? It's insignificant mathematically, right? So we're not going to impact the market. Do we know what the occupancy is in the market? I thought it was 85%. You thought wrong. Let's try another door. Do you know you can get that information for free? Right. So I just went to the Cushman site and got Cushman's industrial information, right? So, you know, according to Cushman, it's 4.2%. So 96% occupancy, vacancy is 4%. So it sounds like there's a lot of demand. So maybe, maybe it starts making sense to buy this, right? Now, now let's keep putting it to, what are the rents in that market? This is in Hialeah. Hialeah, Hialeah. Hialeah Gardens. Hialeah Gardens or Hialeah? And Hialeah Gardens. So let's talk net. Let's just talk net now. Let's talk net. So do we know? So do we know? Do you know? Do you do we know the industrial markets in Dade County, which are the big markets? We said there's 200 million square feet. Where's the bulk of the industrial in Dade? And this is down. This is the Miami River. This is downtown Miami. This is Biscayne Bay. I know I don't draw very well. Okay. Key West. Okay? Not, not the scale. Okay? Not, it's kind of like those New Yorker things, you know? 
New York, New Jersey, California. Okay? <laughs> Do we, MIA is here. Miami Beach is here. That's starting to look, Nova is here. We're right here. Florida, Fort Lauderdale International is there, okay? MIA is here. Do we know where the industrial? West. So there are several, there are three major sub-markets. There's one which we call Air Airport West. It could be Doral. It's mainly what's now the city of Doral, Airport West. There's another one which we call, which we call Medley, okay, which is just north of it, okay? And then we've got... Yeah, so we've got, there's two Hialeahs, okay? There's a so, sort of Hialeah Gardens, and then there's, there's the old Hialeah, and that's totally, that's product like first generation type stuff, but this is where you've got the, and then up here, right on the county line, there's a little bit of product here in um, the Sunshine Industrial Parks, like 20 million square feet, and you've got some in Miami Lakes, but, but basically it's these markets, okay? Do we know what the rents are here? So we're... This, this parcel is somewhere like here, okay? Uh, do we know what, where, what rents are there, roughly? Cole, no idea? If you're paying 150 bucks a square foot, you're going to have to figure that out, right? Because ultimately, we've got to figure out what our return is, right? And what our yield is, right? So what if I told you that rents there were... So this guy told me yesterday, rents are... They're building right across the street from them. Like Ralph. What are rents? He said, you're going to get seven to eight bucks net a square foot. It's like, what is, what is, uh, Cushman tells us for warehouse product, airport north, what they call airport north slash medley, airport west, and Hialeah, it's anywhere from seven to eight thirty. So the guy's right on it, okay? He's on it. So let's do the math. What kind of development yield am I building to if I can get eight bucks a square foot, and it cost me $150 a square foot all in. Sam, come on, figure it out. You don't have a calculator? I do. You came to class without a calculator? I love your assumptions. Cole. I was doing oh, Yeah, that's fine. Well, what did you get? I got 5%. Can you give me the, the exact percentage, like 4.6 something or other? 5.3. You got 5.3 at 8. Yeah, maybe at 8 that's what it is. What if it's 7 bucks? 7 flat? Four yeah, what if it's 7 bucks? I mean, if we, we could do a data table. 4.6. 4.6. So we're building anywhere from 4.6 to 5%, 5.3% in place yield. Now, Isabel, is it worth it? Uh, not really. Should not be. really. Why not? It needs to be six and up. It should be, it should be six and up. It should be six and up. Why should it be six and up? <laughs> I mean, what's the cap rate? I mean, well, so so that's a very good question. Okay, so John is asking, what is cap rate? Okay, what's the other question we need to be asking? If we're the developer, what's, what's the question we need to be asking? What's our cost of capital? What's my cost of capital, right? Because, because if I don't know what my weighted average cost of capital is, I have no idea if building to this yield makes sense. Because if my cost of capital is 6%, should I build to this? No. no. Probably not. If my cost of capital is 4%, should I build to this? Maybe. Start getting closer, right? Now, this is what's happening in the marketplace, okay? Now, um, when Duke paid the, the whatever it was for these 600,000 square feet, we translated to this, okay? Um, people were talking that it was things in the forecast, okay? So, one of the buildings was stabilized, okay? The others were not. So it's really kind of hard to sort of price that to a cap rate, okay? So the question is, if I'm a developer and I build this and I lease it 
and I'm getting a 5.3% yield, should I develop it? So the first question you ask is, what's my, cost of, what's my cost of capital? But the second thing is, is what can I sell it for? Look, exactly. So what can I sell it for? What can I sell it for, Chase? What can I sell industrial for today? Class A industrial in a port city. If you could sell it for 4%, but what if I tell you you could sell it for 4%? Would you build it? Yeah, I mean, if you had the right holding period return, right? If you were going to build it and then sell for 4%. I'm going to sell it right away. Oh. No. Why not? I mean, you break even, right? You would just break even over your net profit. Right? No. I mean, yeah. there's a spread there, isn't there? Oh, okay, so you make one first. So this is kind of like going in cap rate. Right. And this is like exit cap rate. So, so as a developer, this may make sense. The question is, is what kind of spread is there between my development yield and my exit cap? And it looks like you've got at most, at most 130 basis points and at least 60 basis points. What is the basis points? One, 100, right? Okay, so, so you're building, so yes, there is spread here. There is spread between your going in and your coming, coming out cap, and that's always positive. You'll get to some examples as we go forward and we'll start building sensitivity tables going forward. We'll look, you'll look at the difference in IRR based on entry and exit caps, but if you go in at a higher cap rate than what you go out at, there's profit there. There's profit there. You want to do the math? Or do you believe me? Yes, Kenny? That's not taking into account selling fees, leasing fees, and all these other things. Though. Or, or, or greasing the local commissioner. Hey, you know, the hey, we're pro. Americans, we don't do that. No, no, no. listen, I, I'm throwing, the, the reality is, is that cost needs to have all, it may not have my transaction costs, but it should have all of my, all in development costs. And I don't teach the accounting class anymore. But, but when you take a look at a building cost, you go through a stabilization period and you capitalize all those costs. So those costs are inclusive of everything that needs to get you to the point that you can sell it. Okay? So, yes, Jose Paulo. Wouldn't that be 70 basis points, not 60? Um, I don't know, from 4 to 4.6? Oh, sorry. No, no, that's okay. I I was was bad. But, but, but just, I mean, guys, do the math. If I have NOI of 100 and I, and I can, and I buy it in a five cap, how much did I just pay for it? 2,000? Yeah, you it. 2,000. So I bought it, I bought the 5.3 at 2,000, right? If I have 100, and sell it at a four cap, what do I get for it? 2,500? Yeah. So, so if I have reversion, or if I have compression of the cap rate from when I buy it to when I sell it, or from when I build it to when I sell it, I can make money. The question you need to ask yourself in a development program is, is, is that enough of a spread for the risk that you take, for the development risk that you take? Well, wow, so you so generally you're just playing on the margins, pretty much. As a developer, that's all you are. Because you're, you're just mar developers got no money. Squeezing and expanding the much you, the most. Developers have no money. Hey, no, no, no. Listen, I'm not look at Trump. The guy's got no money. Why do you think he doesn't want to disclose his tax return? I'm okay. judging. I mean, <laughs> it's all about like fast cars, beautiful women, boats. All you know, day. All, all day. Yeah. Developers have no money. They play with other people's money. So. The concept of a merchant developer in this country is one that plays with other people's money and you earn fees to pay your day to day and you earn promoted stakes. You asked me we we're going to go over waterfalls in this. 
We may get to waterfalls. We probably will. But developers make money on transactions. So this is the full cycle. I buy 18 acres of land, or I can build 320,000 square feet. It costs me $150 a square foot. I'm in at $50 million. I can rent those 320, do the math, 320 times 8. It's like 2.6 something million. How much? Uh, it was, I have to view it again, but it was like 2.6 million. 2560. What do you mean 2560? You said 320 times 8. 150, $150 oh. a square foot yeah. times $8. 1200. 1200. A million two hundred. Okay. Right? Cap that at four. Thirty mil? Thirty thousand. Yeah, thirty mil. You said a million two hundred. So the twenty thousand square feet. Divide by point oh four is thirty mil. You trying to get the value of the Okay, the cash flow, 320,000 square feet. 320,000 square feet at $8 is $2.5 million a year. Not a million. It's $2,560,000. Right. Divide that by 0 .04, and now you've got a terminal value of $64 million. So, do you want to build it or not? To make $14 million on the deal? Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hello? Yeah. I, when do we start? Yes, no. <laughs> but how do you push the cap rate down to create value? No, you can't push it. The market sets the cap rate. Why? Oh. Did you did you lose all this? Yeah, it's like you're going way fast. Okay, we're gonna slow it down. <laughs> 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 is this oh, critical? Of course it's critical. This is the business. Oh, this is the business that we want to get into. So, but what you can do is you can make sure that you're building it at the right cap rate. But you can't control market rents. Uh, no, but you can't. You can't control the costs. You can't control any of this. You're I got just, a question. I got a question. So you okay. said that the current market rate was 5.7, right? right? No, I said that that's what your development yield was. And okay, they, so we're going to do a quiz now. No. <laughs> <laughs> listen, okay, okay. listen, I'm going to summarize, I'm going to summarize what we just did. Real quick, just give me a second. Okay, Andrew? We're going to buy 18 acres of land for $20 a square foot. And we just said that that was roughly a million dollars an acre. So we're going to pay $18 million for land. Right? Right. We can build 320,000 square feet. I just told you that that's going to cost $100 a square foot. We said about 50 with all that. With land, okay. 150. X land, 100. Okay. So we're going to pay $32 million. Building, soft and hard all in, okay? So it's going to cost us $50 million to buy this land and build a 320,000 square feet. Now we haven't done a, hopefully we'll get a chance to build a development budget in this class. Hopefully we progress to that. So we can blow that out. I'm just giving you these numbers right now, okay? Now, so that's what we're in at. What can we rent this for? Yeah. Call it eight dollars. Let's just be optimistic for a second. We can rent three hundred and twenty thousand square feet at eight dollars a square square foot triple that. How much is that? Two million five hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Okay, now 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 what is my development yield on this? What is this divided by that? What am I building to? What am I building to? Huh. No, dude, divide. 
Five, we just did it. 5.2 or 5.3? 5.12. So call it 5.1, okay? We're building to a 5.1% 5, 5 development yield. Okay? That doesn't sound rich, but we're developers. We're building to lease to flip. We're flippers, Judson. We're flippers. Okay? <laughs> Justin's a flipper. Okay? The boy. You like that? Okay. So we could you bet? we could we could develop it for our account and then then the question becomes very easy. If we're building to a 5.1 development yield, right, then we could do a model, right? We could build in rent growth, right? And then we can discount that at our weighted average cost of capital and figure out if it makes sense for us, right? But if our weighted average cost of capital is probably somewhere around 6%, it probably makes no sense for us to hold this long term. Now, what I'm telling you is that in the market today for industrial, cap rates are 4%. So I could sell this for 4%. So that gives me a sales value or a fair market value of this of how much? 64. 64 million dollars. So I could very easily, right, spend 50 and get 64 and make a 14 million dollar profit. Does that make sense now, yes. Sam? Does that make sense, that Juanita? So Brian? Much nicer. Yes. $7 or rent, it's yeah, no, it is. Okay, so at $7, we could do data tables here, right? But at $7, right, it only becomes how much? What's the. It's, it's, oh, uh, it's, I don't know what the. So it's. Uh, 2.1 or something like that? 2.14? What is 1%? 2.24. It's 4%. Okay, and add up. And at a four cap, that becomes about 56 million, right? Yeah. So now that's a little bit, that's a little bit, that's a little bit tighter, right? Now, so the, the concept that I talked about here, the concept that we talked about here was we talked about new concepts, development yield, we talked about reversion, right? Right? And we talked about development profit, okay? And the last one we talked about is, is spread, okay? That 4%, is that the cap rate? Yes, sir. That's what I'm telling you is the market cap rate for Class A industrial in, in port cities today in America, in Miami. So maybe it's 4.25, okay? Okay, now, spread here, 5.1 to 4 is 110 basis points. Per square foot? No, that's not per square foot, that's yield, man. Okay. I'm going in at 5.1, I'm going out at 4. I'm developing to 5.1, I'm selling at 4. I've got 110 basis point spread. Should I take that? Yes. Why? I mean, but that's... Okay, now, now yeah. Toby Wilson, who's the mayor of Medley, is going to come out and he's going to harass you and shake you down. Now all of a sudden it's going to take you three years to build it because you don't want to give the guy and then, and went, and then the economy tanked right. and now you, you can't lease it. Oh, well, then you, then you're screwed. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. so I'm going to get to your question, Judson. So I asked this question when I got into this business 20 years ago to the people at Prudential. So what kind of a spread do you guys look for when you're taking development risk? The answer at the time was two and a quarter to two and a half. So 225 to 250 basis point spread between exit cap and development yield. I thought that was really low for the risk they were taking, but that was an institutional, an institutional answer to me, to my question at that point. Okay? So two point, yes, so two Judson. You said two and a quarter to 2.5? 225 to 250, oh, okay. 250 bits okay, is... So it, it, Listen, you're assuming a lot of risk is what is, you know, the whole development risk is a lot. So the question is, yeah, they look like big dollars if everything goes well. But you're assuming a tremendous amount of risk. And, and there's one thing I haven't, there's one problem here. We don't have a, a course here on debt. We'll talk a little bit about debt in the next couple of weeks. But who's going to guarantee the construction loan? 
So one other question. So you're saying that four percent is going to be standard? So you're not going to have any issue selling it at a four percent cap? Well, I didn't say that. That's what the market would yield. But what I'm telling you today, 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 for Class A industrial in a major port city like Miami, it would not be unreasonable to think that four is a realistic cap rate to sell at. If you saw my video the other day, and you saw that I. I don't think I, I showed Simon. I, I did I did it for Pro Lodges, but I don't think I showed it. These big REITs are have weighted average cost of capitals in the four and a half percent range. They can buy stuff at four caps all day. As long as there's bumps in it, they can buy stuff at four caps and not be dilutive. Plus they bring operational efficiency to all these assets. They put insurance under a national umbrella policy, right? They do management in house. So, you know, all of a sudden a four cap that they bought in all of a sudden becomes a four and a half yield just from efficiencies, let's say. Okay. And so, 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 um, yeah, I mean, that's multifamily, uh, uh, class A CBD office, industrial and major port cities, you're probably in four, four and a half cap rate. You know, class A retail. Yeah. All over the, you know, six and a half, seven, eight caps, you know, even more. I mean, that's all dislocated now. You hospitality, I don't know where hospitality's at right now. But, but, but class A office, multifamily, and industrial and major port cities there. Now, suburban office, it's a different, not the same credit profile, not the same income stream, probably six, six and a half, you know, something like that. Yes, Cole. If they're all Class A, then how would one choose like which niche to pursue? If they're all Class A, how would you decide like which product to that? that so, you so one of the one of the things that I mentioned in um, in one of the videos I forget was you know, in this country there's been a discussion as to whether specialization trumps the you know diversification or not, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at modern portfolio theory, you know, it talks about you know diversification is the way to mitigate mm -hmm. risk. Um, REITs in this country have become highly specialized by asset class. So they become they're specialized in in a way of equity and in a way of mortgage, right? So they'll either invest in real estate or they'll invest in financing for real estate because to take advantage of the, the, the REIT structure, they, it's got to produce passive income, which is rent. But but the the equity REITs are pretty pretty specialized by asset class, and so I'm not telling you that that's right. But what it does say is that the the sort of management thinking today is that specializing in a particular asset class is going to bring you efficiencies. Mm -hmm. uh, that's in a public realm. In a private realm, people talk about the styles of investing we talked about the other day, and so funds are looking for a particular profile of return given certain parameters. So um, if you're running a core real estate fund, you could look at Class A office, or you could look at Class A industrial, or you could look at Class A multifamily. And then you say, which one do I pick? Well, it's one of the points we talked about the other day is what a lot of these people do is they, they do correlation analysis. And so what they're looking for are markets and asset classes that are not correlated with one another. So they'll pick city pairs. I, I, I've got a presentation that somebody gave me on this one. So people will do correlation analysis between cities. And so they'll start saying, you know, we'll see that, you know, Fargo, North Dakota, to say something is highly uncorrelated to all the other major metros. So we'll want some exposure there because what that means is, while some may be tanking, that's not going to be affected or it's going to act independently. What we talked about the other day, we talked about um, inverse correlation and positive correlation and and for portfolio co construction people people want you know little correlation so so what you look at are things you know markets you know and where you perceive um, to have low correlation with the balance of the portfolio does that make sense mm -hmm. at least theoretically no not good okay. yeah all right yeah Gnarly? Mm -hmm. Rad. Rad? Yeah. You guys ready for a quiz? No, I'm not going to do a quiz on this. God no, bless you. Huh? When bless you. PTSD. Bless you. <laughs> I, I, I won't do this one. Uh, 
Do we have any questions on this? Yeah, when it comes to the development, how much does the velocity of uh, producing these assets take into play? So I've got, I've got architects in here and I've got construction people in here. I'm going to give you a, a rule of thumb for office and industrial. Um, and I want to tell you that probably the fastest that you're going to be able to get something off the ground no, I don't mean stabilized. I don't mean construction wise, I mean velocity of you turning the money over. Well, how do you turn money over if you don't build it first? Well, that's true. So you got to start by building something, <laughs> then you got to lease it, then you can sell it. So you got to look at that period first, right? What's the path? Um, I mean, you could build a box, you could build a suburban office building probably 9 to 12 months. By the time you permit, or getting all the permits in place, getting everybody mobilized, building, you're probably looking at a year and a half to two years. And getting stuff stabilized, there's a sort of rule of thumb that people talk about. So you could build, you can build to suit, or you can build on a speculative basis. So as developers, we do one of two things. We build the suit, we have a tenant, and we build to their specifications or to our specifications, but we've already got the tenant that's going to pay for our specifications. Or you can build on a speculative basis, which means you have no tenants and you're speculating. You're building, hoping that if you build it, they will, they will come. come. You probably, so you always want to have a tenant, but that's not realistic. And you don't totally want to speculate. Because what happens when you speculate? Mm. It doesn't always work out. So I, I mean, our rule of thumb was always we always looked for uh, we, we we you know we had a brokerage operation and, and so our brokerage and property management groups were really not profit centers, but they brought us market knowledge. Okay, and so we tried to understand where the market was at. Uh, um, sort of rule of thumb is when we had a building, so we always had we we built master plan parks. We would always be ahead of the development curve, so we'd be. We'd be clearing sites. We'd already have um, um, architectural drawings done. We'd have building permits pulled, and we'd be moving, you know, just a little bit of dirt just to keep it alive. And our goal was, um, once we had like a, a building 50% pre-leased, we we'd break ground. Okay, we'd like totally go vertical with it. Okay, so that we kind of cut things. So we we looked for some market momentum mm -hmm. in order to get get the building built. But it's still a good sort of rule of thumb is if you're building on a speculative basis, it's going to take you a year to, to lease up something. So uh, when you're looking about, you know, you're talking about the velocity or, you know, how quickly can you turn that money from acquisition to selling could easily be three to four years. Uh, it's, it's unlikely that you can undertake a development project. Now, yeah, you can find a deal. So all of a sudden, you know, you're a developer. You know, broker brings you a deal. Oh, it's yeah. a build the suit, and I got, and, and you can get to a site. And maybe, maybe, and, and it's a build the suit for sale. Maybe you can do it in two and a half years. But, but you're probably, I think, minimum, you know, three to four years. Does that answer your question? Somewhat. It just. I mean, at the end of the day, what you just said just tells me that you need to have operational efficiencies and manufacturing efficiencies in order to 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 produce those results. Yeah, you but can't I mean, just, yeah, you can't just build. No, you're right. No, you're right. I mean, I mean, and hopefully, you know, part of what you know the construction management class here, you know, teaches you, and hopefully, what you know, working in an organization that has a good development team, hopefully, a good development team has. Good architects, good engineers, good GCs, right? Cost controls. Uh, uh, good brokers. Uh, a, a lot of developers will do estimating in-house. I mean, they'll still rely on their GCs, but they'll have an estimating group because they want to, you, you know, they, they really want to control the process. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a complicated business. It's not difficult, but it's, you know, like any other business, it's not easy and it, there's time. And, and even in a development cycle, like, I mean, you, you need to have patient money. You need to have patient money. 
So, anyway, any any other questions on this? What does it at least open up? Miriam, does it got to make a little bit of sense or a little bit? What is the uh, smart strategy to so get in with as many CRAs as possible so you can possibly get a bid that you can build a system? I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know, Ramon. I, you know, you're 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 taking a look at, at um, you're taking a look at a, pub, a lot of public sector type work, and I, I don't know personally how all that works and how bids are awarded and how political the processes are, how clean or transparent they are, uh, and I really don't know, you know, sort of profitability on a lot of this stuff. The the the, the, the take out on a lot of these. You know what potentially are subsidized projects and all that may not have the same sort of cap rates associated with them, okay? Because all of a sudden you're looking at things that either have direct or indirect rent controls associated with them. All of a sudden, it's not like you just cap things like a perpetuity the way we talked, you know, in the video the other day. Because Rizzo Massive does like in Homestead, for example, they just they're just halfway through building this new bowling alley center, whatever it is. Behind it, they want to build uh, two condo um, residential. They want to get rid of the laundry mat and everything behind it. They don't have anyone to build it yet. So what I'm saying is in a situation like that where... Yeah, and li listen, in, 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 in land-constrained environments like South Florida, uh, a developer that controls land, you know, is a king. I, I, we, I did a thing before we sold the business. I reckon... And now, I mean, this, this parcel, that the 10-acre bit was sold for 30 bucks a square foot. Um, we bought that as a landfill for about $1.20 a square foot. And uh, um, I cobbled together almost the entire section of land. So it wasn't quite the 640, but it's about 610 acres. And um, between that site, which we called County Line, Flagler Station and Beacon Lakes. I mean, I reckon we controlled something like 70% of the industrial developable acres in Dade County. Now, Beacon Lakes was a joint venture with Pro, what's Pro Lodges now, it was A and B at the time. But um, yeah, so our thing was if you can control developable land, you win. As long as you've got the patient enough money to get there, right? Because you've got to be able to live through development cycles. Um, now, you know, the market's changed in the last 10 years, so, you know, there, there's been a couple of expansions of the urban development boundary in Dade County, and, um, but any time you can get your, your, you know, your hands around land, and to the extent that you can get land and then do some sort of land use to it, to a greater use, so you buy it with use A, and you can convert it to use B, and use B has a higher value, there's, so there's upside in, in building the one yield and selling it different, <laughs> But there's also value in buying land at a particular, you know, value or you know, end use and converting it to a higher use. Okay. Talking about a horizontal development. Just flipping the thing, you know, you buy a piece of land that's zoned agricultural and you convert it to residential. Yeah. You know, uh, you, historically in this country, it may be under duress now, but historically, you know, you, you, you buy a, a, you know, an industrial site that you can convert to retail. Our retail is not in vogue now, but it used to be a higher use than industrial, right? Uh, or, or you know, the problem with industrial to residential is you usually have site conditions that don't make it that easy to, you know. But you can think in urban cores, maybe not in South Florida, but urban cores where you can take old loft type buildings and stuff, stuff that was, you know, zoned office, and, and all of a sudden you create a higher density uh, with multifamily or something. So anytime that you can do it, you don't have to develop it. Now you've got a right that, that has value. So there's a lot of different ways to make money. I mean, the higher the value, if you take a look at, if you look at the value creation, the earlier the genesis of the process, the more the value creation that you can make, right? You can make a lot more for a lot less money by buying the land and changing the use than you can by building to 110 basis point you know, spread. Okay? I mean, you could double values here. Here you're talking about like little, you know, little nibbles compared to further up the food chain. But that requires local knowledge and expertise. 
and right. like consultants and luck and political savvy and you know and a bunch of other things. Did so. you want to go over the weighted average cost of capital formula? Because he said figuring it out for real estate companies was really difficult. I think the way, the, but you needed that for the discount rate for what he built the. <laughs> it's not that complicated, man. Does it look complicated? <laughs> Some people. It's very it's simple. Down. It's 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 your cost of debt, cost of preferred, preferred stock, yeah, totally cost right. of equity, and it's the proportion of that right. times the cost of debt times one minus your tax rate plus the proportion of preferred stock over total capital to your cost of preferred, which is the coupon rate, which is the coup average coupon rate, and the total equity over total capital multiplied by your cost of equity, and you could use CAPN or the Gordon growth model um, to calculate that if you've got um, stable growth. So one is cost, the other is debt, the other is equity. Yeah. I didn't know that. It's what video. is it? It's not a video. Yeah. Doesn't mean it sticks. Okay. It does <laughs> that. Preferred stock, equity. Sticks down. Yes. That's good. So, um, actually, before you erase that, in, in, uh, in real estate, the preferred stock, right, that's like private money. Is it? No. No. How would that, how would that work? Joint ventures? No, preferred stock, I mean, in, in the REIT realm, preferred stock is used a lot. So in the private realm, people don't use preferred stock so much. People use MASDAQ. So, uh, so um, think of preferred and MAS as being between debt and equity, but having some sort of feature of, 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 the, of the others. Preferred stock is stock, and MASDAQ is debt. So they're different, but they're sort of in the middle between traditional debt and traditional equity. Mm -hmm. Um, preferred stock, uh, it's a, it's a, you know, it's just, it's, 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 it's a stock, so it's a residual claim on company assets after all liability has been satisfied, it has preference to common, but it also has a common, it has a, a lot of the features of debt, okay. so it'll have a coupon, it, it'll, it, it'll, it could have a call price, so it could be callable. Uh, it, it could be cumulative. And it could be convertible. Okay, so it, it you know it could be perpetual too, but it could. Um, no, mes debt tends to just be debt, so it tends to be subordinated debt, higher coupon rate, and it's typically secured by the owner's equity interests in the venture. Okay, so um, I I I don't need to spend. Uh, a lot of time on what the book talked about with diligence. I'm kind of losing track of time because it's a uh, two or five. No, it's only one. No, that's an hour behind. No, 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 no. It's one o'clock. No, no it's, it's not. not. It's one o'clock. No, it's one o'clock. No, it's not. No, it's two. Check your phone. <laughs> I don't. I don't bring my phone. Well, to the class. clock and that is wrong. It's two o'clock. No, no, no. Still, that, that one's hey, ahead. I still got three that and a half hours. <laughs> Okay, look, um, diligence, so, so chapters, I'm going to go to the textbook for a second. Uh, chapter 7 talked purely about diligence, and chapter 12 talked about buying an entire company, okay, and I, I, I don't, so, so in the context of real estate, we don't really buy a lot of real estate companies. I, Curiously, we did sell a real estate company, and so a lot of the, the issues that this guy talks about are things that came up. But 
Um, there's really not a lot of difference between buying real estate and buying companies. Just when you buy a company, there's some additional considerations that you need to have. Okay. Um, chapter eight talked about um, long-term growth patterns and metros, and uh, you know I don't have a lot to add to that. I, I do things a little bit differently, but you do have a like a GIS class and a market analysis class in the program where you look at things in a a totally different optic then and I kind of look at things just pure sort of supply demand and what the impact is on the pricing. And, uh, and Brian, we are going to take a, a, a break early today, so you're not going to ask me today. And we'll <laughs> Before you ask me, we'll take a break today, okay? He's about um, to ask you right now. <laughs> well, if he asks me, he's going to have to wait. So point, I wanted to preempt him, okay? Uh, so due diligence is a process that we undertake typically, and we think about it, that we undertake prior to acquiring something. Okay, so in our context, we talk about real estate, but it could be if you're buying a company. My brother's selling, my brother owns uh, a bunch of, my brother sells pretzels, those Auntie on things. So, like he sells the franchises or just he no, works he at an has, we have, Well, I'm in the deal, so. Somehow he gets, he drives a nice car. I don't get anything, but anyway, he, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't even, I don't follow it because he's the one who works it. But um, we have like 40 of these Antions and and like uh, Cinnabons and stuff like that. Close and so, here. no, most of them are, most of them. So they're in New York. There's some here. So it's New York, some here, and some in Puerto Rico. So he bought it from a guy who started with one. And he got moved to Boca. He retired. He moved to Boca, and he kept buying more. And he was one of the largest franchisors in the network. And so my brother bought it, and he's added a bunch of stores and opened up some. We own the ones in at Macy's in New York, at the big store there. There's we actually have a a Carvel there as well. That that's really outside of. So anyway, he's selling it. There's a so he, he was gonna. He always went to the franchise. Uh, franchise sees meetings looking for people that wanted to sell one-off stores because his goal was to sort of bolt on a lot and he came across some guys that actually said hey we, we, we want to buy this and it's guys that own a couple of own, manage a family office for two large families and so they're gonna buy it my brother's gonna stay managing it for a while and then but anyway but these guys are doing their investigation they're doing their diligence so they look at different things because they have leases right so they look at lease terms and they look at cash flow and you know when you look at real estate you, you look at leases and you look at cash flows but there's a whole bunch of other stuff you got to take a look at because it's like a, a real tangible asset that you got to go with and ultimately what i say is due diligence is about mitigating risk okay it's ultimately saying so you can look at it from a very pragmatic way you could say if this thing blows up somewhere down the line I, i'll make sure that i did everything that i that i could do so it doesn't become my problem right so that I, if I'm just an employee, that I don't get fired. Or if I'm an owner and I have money at risk, that I don't lose money, right? So uh, that, that encompasses a lot of different things, and there's a lot of different ways to look at it. One of the things that I will do for you next week is I will leave you, I will send you probably, I think, I think I've got like four or five different checklists that I, I send to students. So, um, they're checklists that are been prepared by different people, which have a totally different perspective. So, if you talk to an engineer about diligence in a building, they're going to talk to you about structural integrity and mechanical systems, Is that true? And, and roofing and glazing and all that kind of stuff, right? If if you talk to if if you talk to like some sort of like civil guy, they're going to say or an environmental engineer, like, oh no no, you got to take a look at environmental. And emissions and, and, and flows of contaminants from other sites. And um, if you talk to like you know an accountant guy, you know he's going to say, no, no, you got to take a look at the historical financial statements, and you got to take a look at the historical tax returns and make sure that what they're telling you is true and has been proven. If you're looking at more of a marketing person, they're going to say, hey, you got to take a look at the leases, you got to take a look at the lease terms, right? You got to you got to look at the market, you got to. Look at the, the spread, the mark, the market opportunity that exists. Um, if, if you talk to an operational guy, a property management you know, person, they're going to tell you about, you got to take a look at all the contracts that are in place and, and who does the cleaning and, and, and who services the boiler and who fixes the, you know, the elevator and who does the cleaning and 
how much you pay for electricity. And so when you look at all of those things, it's kind of the, the, the old, I think I said this once, and you said you didn't like this, but it's the old, um, there's a, a Zen Buddhist thing. There's a, there's a, this monk, this, uh, the, what do you call it, the abbot, like the abbot, the guy that runs a, a Zen monastery, sends four monks out, young monks out, blindfolded to look for an elephant. <laughs> and so they're all blindfolded, and they're all out there, and, you know, they're touching and all that, and, and they all come back in. You look at me like, where's this going, right? So they all come back in, and, and, and the abbot says, what's the elephant like? And so one of the guys says, oh, it's like a wall. I was pounding on it, and it wouldn't move. And then the other one says, no, 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 no. It was like a hose, and it would move, and it had it was kind of like wet in the, at the end. And the other one said, no, 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 it was like a rope, and it moved, but it was really furry. And it was no, 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 it was like a tree trunk. You know, I put my arms around it. And so the question is, which one of those monks had the truth? All of them. They all did, but none of them had the, the entire, truth. The entire yeah. truth, right? And that's, when you look at diligence, there's this whole truth out there, so you can't just look at, oh, and I forgot, looking at the attorney, if you talk to an attorney, you gotta look at title, you gotta look at, you know, you gotta look at easements, you gotta look at all sorts of zoning and, and, and permits and municipal codes, and so they're all good, and litigation, and so they're all, and you gotta look at that, and if you're talking to the finance guy in the company, they're just saying, well, how do we substantiate the cash flow and how do I get this finance and when do the leases expire? And, and so all these truths come to play in diligence and that's why I'm going to send you four or five checklists because at the end of the day, no one checklist and no one book. I used to use, for those of you that I, I used to, you know, we used to use this little book in the class. There's a lot of different ways to look at it, but you got, anytime you look to buy something, you got to create your own list. You got to create your own methodology, and you got to create your own process based on the particular circumstances. I set up a diligence practice for Ernst and Young for Latin America. We had like a 20-page template to build a, a, a due diligence program for any particular. But part of our work was to sit down in advance and understand what, what kind of business we were looking at, to try to figure out the steps that we needed to take to advise our clients. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering like. At what point, or if there's ever a point where you can assess that look being too diligent, is, is there is ever a thing like that where you kind of like overkill it to the point where you discourage yourself from ever investing in anything? Does that make sense? Analysis or paralysis by now? Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, analysis. yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, the answer is probably yes. I mean, uh, but that's with anything. I would tell you this. I would tell you this. I think there's certain things. I was telling some um, some friends of mine called me uh, from Spain the other day. One of they were looking at a hotel development site in, in D.C. And I'm like, oh, 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 guys, get on a plane. Stop putzing around. Get on a plane and go kick the dirt. Go, go, and forget what people are sending you. Go and look at it. That's the most important thing. Touch it, okay? I said, and the other thing is, is and this is my rule of thumb, uh, anytime you look at something, if you're not prepared to spend a couple hundred thousand bucks Hiring an attorney to take a look at title and stuff like that. Hiring an environmental engineer. Hiring a firm to take a look at structural. You know, um, having somebody put all the leases on Argus and model all this stuff out. Hiring somebody to do a market, you know, study for you. Um, um, uh, you're not going to be able to underwrite something. So, I think there's a sort of minimum number of things out there that you could do, and then. Yeah, you can dig to the point where you can talk yourself into saying, well, these people are never going to, you know, they'll never renew or, well, these people are, you know, going to go bankrupt or whatever, okay? So, you know, there, in any business, there's always risk, right? There's risk getting out of bed in the morning. So, um, you can definitely talk yourself out of stuff in diligence. But, uh, I, what I would tell you is, is it relates to institutional loan real estate in this country. And it's the interesting thing. I, you know, I, I spent time with this whack thing, right? Because it's all sort of circular thinking. I, I told you guys I don't want to tell you what cap rates were. I was going to let you figure them out, right? And there was this theoretical formula in, in the book, right? It talks about uh, 
cap rate is discount rate less stabilized growth rate, right? Um, you know, the reality is most firms out there today in this industry have similar, le similar leverage, similar, similar sources of equity and similar so sources of debt at the same costs, at the same uh, uh, tax structures. And the reality is in real estate we tend to talk about tax efficient environments so there's no tax involved. So people tend to have very similar very similar costs of capital, and people tend to have um, 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 very similar expectations on growth rates. And then we talk about, I, I showed in, uh, in the slide in one of the videos that long-term you know, inflation in this country runs it. I think in the period I looked at was a little bit higher, it's like 3.9%, but inflation in this country, cost of living in this country is about 2.5% every year. Most leases in this country have 25 to 3% rent increases. So you can easily get to the same kind of cap rate, even though the market tells you what the cap rate is. You can, you can look at a bunch of transactions and figure out what the cap rate is, but you can, you can sort of empirically calculate it as well, right? And, and the proof of all of this is there's a theory that says, I, I told you people that real estate is a financial asset, and a financial asset is worth nothing more and nothing less than the net present value of the future cash flows, right? And so a, an intelligent and willing buyer would never pay more than what that net present value is, nor would a willing seller ever sell for less than that, right? And so you've got a point where things transact. And, and if, if theoretically that doesn't make sense, I'll tell you empirically, you can look at a Class A asset in this country today. Um, I'll give you a Class B. I'm, this is a deal that just is in the market now. I'm in a deal that we own a shopping center down in Pinecrest. Uh, JLL has it right now, the retail guys have it. So they sent flyers. They'll probably send 40 to 50 books out to people. Okay? Um, out of those, they're probably going to get about, and I can tell you this for almost all institutional transactions in this country today, they're probably going to get 20 to 25 people that actually take a look at it. Uh, they've already told the manager what they think they're going to get for it, okay? So they've told them X. I don't know what that X is, okay? And when I say I'm in this deal, I, you know, I own like the corner of a parking spot, okay? Um, out of those 20 or 25 guys, probably 10 to 12 are actually going to submit bids. Do you know what the dispersion is going to be in those 10 guys? Let's say that the price is $25 million. Do you know where these guys are going to be? What the range? We talk about dispersion. We talk, do you know what the range is going to be? 15 to 35. Percent? I'm going to tell you, the broker's already guiding them. They've put together Argus runs. They've given them the people. They're telling them what the seller's expectations are. They're already telling them the kind of financing that they could get in place. I read one of those for you last week, right? You're probably going to get... Um, you're probably going to get a guy that throws in like a number like 21 million down here, okay? And you might get a guy that throws about 22. <laughs> and you're going to have seven or eight guys that are somewhere between 24, 250, and 24, 800. Now, what does that talk to? In my mind, that talks to not only market efficiency, information is widely known, but the fact that most people have very similar you know, cost of capital, and have very similar expectations of market growth. You know, and then it becomes a process, how do you get invited to the next round, and then who gets picked by the seller? The seller wants somebody who, who can close, who's got certainty to close, who's got, you know, one of those sorts of funds, okay? But what I'm telling you is, is it's very compressed. Why? Because ultimately, ultimately, people, there's, there's no, like, wild arbitrage opportunities out there in this country, okay? There's, uh, th this asset's going to generate a certain cash flow. It's going to have a certain growth rate. And it should, there shouldn't be significant differences between most people. Now, maybe a very intelligent operator does bring certain efficiencies and can afford to pay more because they're going to generate more cash flow. But if we all have the same sources of debt and equity and our work cost of capital is the same, Shouldn't we all be at the same price, more or less? More or less? And that's what the market's I mean, it's what my personal experience tells me. Okay? So, um, so look, if you're analyzing facts and assumptions, 
you're doing sensitivity analysis, you're taking a look at, at external factors. I'll take a look, I'll, I'll bring you not only the checklist next week, and I'll leave those with you, but I'm going to show you books that you know, I've put together, that people put together to justify an, an, uh, an acquisition. And, and they'll show you the things that you look at in order to do it. Yes, Judson. On that, uh, on that deal right there, would you would you say that on average, when they're selling a property like that, they're going to sell it at a four? Like if it was listed at twenty? No, I mean this particular thing. I, I just in it, but just like not necessarily that one, but just overall. I mean, what would they what would they typically list it as? Well, so 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 in institutional sales in this country, we, we I mean, there's no listing price. Yeah. If there's a call for offers. Um, now, now the broker, the broker's given the, the manager, the GP, an indication of value, and they're going to guide bidders to where they think the seller wants to be, and where they think a deal gets done. Um, a, a Class B retail, and it, I mean it's pretty highly leased, but Class, it's a Class A location, I'd say for retail, but it's a Class B center. It has a big office building with it too, so there, there's really it's a sort of mixed use facility. That's probably a five seventy five to six cap rate is what I would tell you. That would be my sense. At twenty five. At twenty five. I I don't know what the I don't know what the value is. Oh. Because okay. I, I forget. I mean, there's there's like thirty thousand square feet of office and like forty thousand square feet of retail. I, I don't know. I, the reason I, I don't know the value. Because I know that earlier we spoke and we said okay, like the market typically would be four to four and a half. Not necessarily. Well no, but that out, no, but. but that and I told you retail today is like forget that and suburban office is not C B D office. So suburban office is already a six cap, I'd say. Okay? Class A Suburban office is 575 to 6 in, in major metros. Yes, Kenny? How would you combine that ca uh, that reversion? Would you separate the cash flows and find the, uh, the, uh, the value for each? Yeah, if you're buying that, so if you're buying that, that, yeah, if you're buying that, I mean, you, you know, there's, a, there's a Argus runs for the office component, there's Argus runs for, for the, uh, the retail component. Um, that that center, I mean, I, I don't think you could split it because they have common parking and all that. So I mean, that center is a mixed-use facility, which is office and retail. But you can take the cash flow from the office and the cash flow from the retail. Well, you ultimately, yeah, you could, yeah, it's one, it's one investment. And, yeah, and then and you can have, it. take the cash flow from the office, take the cash flow from the retail, get the uh, the growth factor and the discount rate for each. And then find the present value for each and then come Well, the discount the rate should be the same for both. Uh. Okay, the discount rate's the same. Now, you can assume different growth. You can have different rent assumptions. You can have different vacancy assumptions, right? Um, you can assign more risk to one or the other based on the credit of the tenants. There's a lot of variables that affect your valuation, right? You can ultimately say retail sells at X cap and office sells at Y cap. And so you're going, to, you're going to be guided or influenced by comparables in the market, okay? But ultimately, a seller wants X, and they're going to sell it for X or not. I mean, they're under no obligation to sell it, so. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to stop because I'm going to cover this next week, okay? I'm going to cover this next week, and what I want to do is, is before we take a break, I want to I want to work a little bit on a couple of things in Excel. And I and before I do that though, what I what I wanted to do was to field any questions on the videos or on any of the things that we did. Okay, hey, Isabel, you've been waiting. You've got been waiting to call on you all day. What is your question? Oh, and the NP. And then when you did the second aisle, or you paused the video when you when you did it, and then I couldn't figure it out. I can't figure out how to go back to. Okay, MPV is. I didn't. You don't need your computers right now. I'll tell you when to open them. You don't need them right now. Let's answer questions first, hypothetically, and then we'll go to the computer. And I want to show something first, first, and then we can go to our computers. Okay, so. Uh, the 
at MPV, right? So how do we get to a function? We can go up to the yeah. ribbon, and we can go to uh, formulas, we can go to financial, yeah, and pull MPV, yeah. or we go equal MPV, yeah. right? Okay, or we go to a little sort of dialog box there to find it. What are the arguments that MPV asks us for? Cash flows. Right. Number of periods. The rates and, and the values. Oh. Totally. Okay, so the first thing is it asks is rate and values. And then values. Okay? And a comma in between. So yes. all, this needs to point to the discount rate yes. you're going to use. Yeah. And this needs to point go to, to your entire row, okay, of undiscounted cash flows, okay, including your original outlay. Yes. Okay? That's the theory. Yes. If it doesn't work for you, I'll come over when we're working and take a look at what specific problem you have. But that's the way it should work. Okay, I did that. It didn't work for me. Okay, and I'll go take a look at it. When we take a break, I will take a look at it. Transpose. Transpose. Okay, there. Followed everything you did in my. Okay, so uh, Isabel, we're asking. He's asking a question. It's good. So transpose the at transpose function is, so these are what they call arrays, okay? And so basically transpose will let us take a, a row, I'm sorry, a column of numbers and convert it into one row or will allow us to take a row of numbers and put it down a column. So we can go both ways, okay? What we need to do is, is if, if we're gonna go and take a row and put it down into a column, we need to identify first how many cells we have. So let's say that we have 10 cells that we're going to transpose down, right? So what we need to do is identify and highlight the 10 cells that we want to do, okay? So we highlight that first, and then we go and hit equals transpose, or go up to the functions and get transpose, and open up the bracket. Now we go and highlight the array Okay, and we close it and we go control shift enter all at one time. What does that do? It allows it to be vertically correct. The, the way like control Excel, shift enter particularly. The, the way yeah. Excel yeah. handles yeah. arrays, mm -hmm. and this is an array in, in Excel lingo, it's not just enter, it's control shift enter. Gotcha. So when you start doing like, and we won't do any of these um, uh, matrices, but if you do matrices in Excel, it's the same thing, Control-Alt-Shift, I mean Control-Shift-Enter, okay? So it's just a way to get it done. Does that end? Now, I'll take a look at it if you want, but that's just the way it works, okay? I heard you say that in the video when I tried it. Control-Shift, it depends where your keys are, Control-Shift-Enter, okay? Isabel, you had another question. Yes, and then regarding the IRR, you yeah. paused the video. You, there's some things when you were doing the IRR, you made a mistake. I, I, I was following it through, but I couldn't find how to get back to reverse the IRR. It to reverse the IRR? Yes, because I accidentally um, take more of the, take the whole. Do you, do you know, I'm going to say, I don't know. I'm going to go take a look at it, but I'm going to suggest something to you, and that is, I am in my computer, and you're welcome to send me your spreadsheet at any time when you have problems. Like other people, have people sent me their spreadsheets this week? Have I responded? Okay, so, so feel free to send them to me, because I would be more than happy to take a look at it. I'll take a look at it now, and see what you can get back to me. Any other? Data tables. Data tables, okay. So we only did we only did one dimensional data tables this week, okay? So so we, we only did one dimensional data tables. You can actually have data tables that are basically two ways. We'll do that either next week or the week after. But uh, we have a cell that we point to, okay? And then we would put a series of variables here. Okay? So up to now. All you need to do is find the formula that you want to change. I kept using IRR because I just kept saying, okay, how does my IRR change based on different variables or inputs? 
Notice what I was saying the sequence before, right? If I have vacancy, right, or rent growth, right, or cost per apartment, right, any one of these are variables that ultimately get me to gross income, right, you know, effective gross income, and ultimately through a series of items down to NOI, and from that NOI I was calculating my RRR, right? So I can basically build a data table to affect any formula that I have, right, by changing any of the, any of the variables that affect that formula. So typically I would say, figuring for IRR, I would point to wherever the IRR is calculated, okay, and then I would put a series of variables here that I want to see sensitivities for. So if vacancy is 5%, I may want to see it at 4.5%, at 4, at 3.5, and at 3, and I may want to see it at 5.5, 6, 6.5, and 7, because those might be realistic, okay. So what I do is I come with my cursor then and highlight all of this, hit data, right? Um, what if? What yeah. if? Data table. Yeah, data data table. table, and then I get a box the one. box, yes. okay? And because we're solving, yes, right? Point. Okay, for here, we go to column. Can we just do that with the, with the and we point the then, then we point here to the variable we're interested in, 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 in changing and seeing that sensitivity on, okay? okay. Hit enter and then it should be good, as long as our plumbing is right. Right. It doesn't, okay. you know, it, it does like little technicality. There, there's technology. certain things, and I, and certain, so for instance, in this, I, I kept having problems in my spreadsheet, I've got that macro that shows you the formulas. Goal seat does not like that macro, so it was messing me up. So I had to like get rid of the macro. Um, Sometimes it doesn't like formulas. Sometimes it's okay, for some reason, it's okay to have a formula in this flow that points from one number to another. Sometimes it wants, like purchase price, it wants to see purchase price. It doesn't want to see a formula for purchase price. And that's, you just gotta play with it. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. okay. Other question, okay. So, so yeah. So, in order to have, in order to have net present value, okay, there has to be an initial outlay, and in a, remember, this is an annuity, right? This is a present value annuity, and so it's I want to pay X in exchange for a series of flows down the line. I want hundred dollars for the next ten years. How much do I have to pay now? So in order to calculate the net present value, right, the present value of that annuity, there has to be an initial outlay. So the answer is yes. There has to be an initial negative. There has to be an initial negative. Now, you can be the bank and do it the other way, right? You take some money and then you pay some out, right? But that's, that's not what we're solving for. I kept getting no when You kept getting? No. Yeah, like an error number, yeah, an error message. Uh, somebody here. Yeah, oh, so change. for the present value, so if you recall, you have like a line of present values beneath the bottom line, I think, yeah. NOI. Well, and then in the first time, on the five year and 10 year, it was different. But in yeah. this particular one, they're all the same numbers, but all of my present value are not all the same numbers replicated as the NOI line. Okay, I, I, you'd have to show me what we're doing. Yeah. But I got, so I, the first or the second week, I had you calculate present values right, and all the of the formula. cells by formula right. longhand so that we would understand what the concept so was. So not crucial? No, we don't do that. No, okay, you just take okay. the whole stream down. Gotcha. You don't need to do gotcha. that. No, 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 no. That was only like a building block. Understood. Yeah, I have that <laughs> too because I have the same numbers, identical, but at the end next to the yellow box below it, there's a value of like a 200 or something like that and I can't replicate that number specifically. Which yeah, I think I think that number you're talking about was that was a, that's a control. I don't know if you guys notice I do reality checks and stuff, right? Yeah, that's a control. That's a control number that I have for when I grade papers, right? To see what's the sum 
what's the sum of like NOI? Because if if my sum is the same as your sum, then you got it right. Uh, right? If, it, if it's not, then I got to see where the error is. Mine's off by 15 million. Oh man, that's like, that's a decent B. <laughs> okay. It's for the second IR table that. For the second IR table. When I went to the what if and the other table, and I accidentally. <laughs> I'll go take a look at it, Isabel. I want to. I want to show. I want to show. I got a. I got a very interesting email from a, a student this week, and I like to bring real life examples. So the student, I, I've asked for permission. It. Um, they shall remain nameless. Anonymous. Well, no, just anonymous. anonymous is like a particular person that like wreaks havoc or something throughout the world. I'm not really sure. Um, but this student will remain anonymous. But the student was kind enough to say, hey, I want to see if this jump we're doing in class really works. And, and I'm, looking at, I'm looking at a 10 unit apartment complex. And, uh, and I want to know if this thing works. So I thought, okay, well let's, so he sent it to me and he goes, it doesn't make any sense or it doesn't look right to me or something like that, can you help me? So I'm gonna pop it up. And I want you guys to help me help this student uh, with how to get this right. Is the person here today? That doesn't help uh, stay anonymous. No, um, but doesn't have to say names. Do you, was it you? No. Are you just trying to confuse everybody? Isabel no, sent me this. No, question. Oh, I'm just causing. Okay, so I got this from I got this from the student. Okay, so. You, let's make it a little bit bigger. Please. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Great. Fly in the front. <laughs> okay. A little bit more, please. Hold on for a second. We're not, we're not even going to look at the numbers first. We're just going to look at a couple of things, okay? So, if you were t sending this into Professor San Miguel, and please lines. don't think. Get rid of the lines. Okay, so there, let's, do, let's clean up these things first, okay? Let's clean up a couple of these things. Let's and pretty quickly. As much as your OCD is a little OCD, I, I, I know it's OCD, it but if you're doing grid lines, <laughs> if you're doing if you're doing like these other things, <laughs> so, so let's get rid of that and let's let's make this a little bit narrower, okay? Now, now, let's start taking a look at a couple of other things. Now you didn't notice it, that the, the cursor was left like down here or something like that. Now. Now, no, no. No, yeah, A one A. Okay, now hold on a second. Hold on, I'm not grading this. I'm not grading this. I'm using this as I'm using this as a learning moment. I'm learning. Okay, so okay, no. So listen, listen. Uh, I could be an investor in this. Okay, so it could be. Hey, professor, do you think you like this? Yeah, it looks great. Then the next question might be, hey, I'm looking for a limited partners in this. Are you interested in buying? So uh, there's a bunch of stuff here, like right there. I don't know what those numbers are. They have no, they don't, so I'm already going to say, okay, let's get rid of that for a second because I have no idea what that is, okay? Now, I'm going to make this bigger. And, and please, whoever sent this to me, don't, uh, this is not, I'm not trying to be critical, okay? But this looks here like sensitivity analysis, different cap rates, different values, and I'm thinking, I'm wondering if we might not be able to build data tables rather than doing individual calculations. Maybe we can find data tables to you know, sort some of this stuff out, okay? So let's get rid of that for a second, okay? Um, now, so, so the, the first thing that struck me, let's look at the, the results here. The first thing that struck me was um, this has a negative IRR. Yeah, she Okay, so my question is, now you see why a student sent it to me, right? It's like, why would I want to invest in something that has a negative IRR? Using right? So when you look at it, I'm assuming that this is a purchase price. I'm assuming because it's not labeled as such, and maybe they just copied my shorthand one day in class. And I'm not going to get into like, I don't know where the underscores, I don't know what number adds to what here. Hmm. So I haven't started auditing this yet, but I'm looking at this and I go, I know there's a problem here. So what's the first thing that I would look at when I'm going to, I got a negative IRR, what's the first reality check I'm going to do? Wow. 
Well, first thing I'm going to look at is I'm going to look at purchase price and then I'm going to look at sales price. So the first thing, so I look at purchase price, we're paying 454. So I can look and figure out what the cap rate is on that, right? We're paying that, right, for, I'm sorry. We're paying for this amount, I'm paying that, right? So, so we're paying like a 6.7 cap, okay? All right, that doesn't sound outrageous. Let me go see what they're selling it for. What are they selling it for? $250,000. Yeah. No, Where? No, price. I don't see reversion anywhere. No. So if we, if so, if we hold an asset in perpetuity, then we don't, re, we, you know, we could just keep discounting all these values. I mean, what happens is eventually after a certain number of years, you know, the present value of numbers is not that much. But one of the reasons that we do assume a, a, a reversion, and I went through that in, in the video, you know, 10 years is a nice comfortable number because it, it overlays with a lot of, 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 of mortgage notes and it overlays with a lot of holding periods on, on private equity funds. But it also gives us a terminal value that we could say, hey, instead of carrying this model out forever, let's figure out what the value is at a particular given point in time. So let's just very quickly, without doing anything else, let's just figure out, let's see, let's, let's figure out, so we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. Let's go on ahead and make an eleventh year, okay? Let's just make an eleventh year. Let's copy that, okay? And let's just bring it across. I don't know. I haven't checked the formulas or anything like that. I don't know. This just seems to be. There's no formulas there. I don't like that. Yeah, because now I, I got to I got to like handwrite all this stuff, right? I mean, God, did this were submitted for a grade? Oh my God. Okay. And there, there's something messed up. Whoa, I don't even know what the, why is it giving me okay so this is let's figure out what this is I gotta make this a little bit smaller for a second okay but so so when you're looking at this when you're looking I haven't looked at this you gotta you gotta build your plumbing in a way that you can easily build on it right so I should be able to add another year and calculate the NOI so I can calculate a terminal value and pop it into my into my cash flow, right? So expenses here, operating expenses are the sum of M13. So we're adding net rental value and they're multiplying it by M40. Oh, but see, so one of the things, I probably would get rid of all these things for every year, but let's just go on ahead and use their methodology. I, if you've got the same if you've got the same percentages all the way across, if you've got constant growth, you don't need to carry it every year and point down to every year. You can point to one cell, anchor the cell, and you don't. So now you guys are starting to like be critical too. You guys, what kind of grade are you going to give this guy on this? A plus. You give... A for effort. <laughs> e is for effort. Okay, so now we got this. E is for effort, not F. Okay, so. The NOI in this year is 40, so uh, should we cap it at the same cap rate? Now, we saw we could play games, right? If exit cap is lower than entry cap, we have a built-in profit, right? So let's, 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 not, let's not create false profits, okay? So let's use the same cap rate, right? And what did we say the cap rate was? So this is uh, it was like 6.7. So let's just for just shortcut it here because you know otherwise we could just sorry. Um, let's just say equals that divided by what 6.7. Okay, so now they can sell it. They sell it for 600,000. Now we can add that to the cash flow for the year, right? And now all of a sudden. If the formula is right, okay. All right, let's do something. Let's let's pop this down here. Let's move that down here. Let's just make this the IRR here. Doesn't just 
I mean, I really, I really should just go on ahead and. I'm doing IRR. I don't need to put a discount rate. No, those are discounted. Right. So, well, it's not discounted. These. Okay. So let's just. Okay. Listen. Let's just rebuild this. So there's a couple of things I wanted to show here. So we can we can rebuild this very quickly. Okay. So. I see that I've got nine units at 490 and one unit at 490. Now, yeah, they're different type units, but they, they, they're the same, right? So what I would probably do, just to make this a lot quicker, 10, okay? And I'd get rid of all, I'd get rid of this and this, right? Because I really only have one class, okay? And this is an array? Wow, that's strange. What if that person is using that model, is using that spreadsheet as a model, if they have other properties and they want to keep continuity across their properties? So instead of right, so, but, okay, so they, they can. Is that James? Yeah, it is. So the answer, James, is absolutely. Uh, the particular question was, I'm using what we've learned in class so that I can build something um, that I could use across other properties. And so the answer is, yeah, you can feel free to use whatever works for your investors, your bank, and yourself and be consistent with it, absolutely, absolutely. So if, if the input of the numbers are correct and it's given correct output, why does it matter to change the underlying structure? Well, I, so, so I'm giving you my practices, right? So you can, you, you can take the suggestions and work with them or not. If I've got one revenue stream, right? If I've got one, all my apartments, I can call them A, B, C, D, or F, one, two, three, four, five. They can have different sizes, but they all pay me 450 or 490. They all pay 490. One can be red, one can be blue, one can be yellow. I see dollars, and I see one class. So I would build a bunch of complexity into 10 units. So uh, that's what I would do, but you don't have to do that. Now, I don't understand why I can't grid, grid, but it doesn't matter. It's all zero. What I'm going to just go on ahead and do is say 10 units, right, times... 490, hold on, times 12, right? Right? And that's what, what I want to get in rents, right? And then I'm just going to grow this every year, right? One plus, what's the growth rate? 3%. 3%. And let's fix that. Right? Okay, and then I can just go on ahead and just copy that all the way across. Right? And we said that rent increases kind of mimic inflation. They tend to. Yeah. I mean, multifamily, the, the difference with multifamily is that multifamily typically have one year leases, but then they're marked to market every year. And so you don't have a, a, a natural bump or rent increase built into contracts because the contracts tend to only be one year. But those increases in rent tend to mirror the cost of living increase. Right. Okay? So, um, so uh, vacancy and collection loss, right? So that's basically that times the 3%, right? Minus... What was the vacancy here? About five percent, right? And let's anchor that. Okay, and let's go on ahead and just let me copy it. Wait, hold on. Both of those. Okay, and let's just go on ahead and put an underline on it. And let's just drag this cell all the way across. Ah, let's copy this all the way across. Okay, and now let's just get the sum here and drag that all the way across, right? And now we can do a reality check too, right? So we know we know that rent in the tenth year there is seventy nine oh twenty two, right? 
But we started with 58. We could use our, our future value formula, right? So we could just go that times one plus Professor. one second, three, right? To what power? The ninth? We got nine years going? Yeah. So I should have $76,720. The VCL is positive. Yeah, I, it's, okay, so I got to make it negative. Thank you. I had that problem too in the yeah, video, right? <laughs> and then I had it in the last year. Okay, but 76 is 76. So it looks like I've calculated it all, all the way out there, right? So I thought I had it negative here. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to go on ahead and copy the same thing. And I'm only going to do, I'm going to add all the expenses. I want to make the expenses 46% for argument's sakes, just to get to a value. Okay. And I'm just going to make this point. I'm going to shortcut it because I just want to get to an answer. Okay. Ah. What does that mean? Uh, I don't know, but it's not good. I've never had that. <laughs> Operating expenses equal that times 46. Okay. I want to make it negative. Okay. And I want to take it all the way across. Okay, and I'm just going to make a sum here of equals this plus this, okay, and I'm going to take that across, right, and now my question is, now you've got an 8% IRR, does that start to make more sense? Might that, might that be a more viable, so what would our weighted average cost of capital need to be below in order for us to have this be a go decision? 8%. Right. Okay. Yes, Andrew? I think that IRR is still using the discounted. Okay, so let's get rid of that. So let's make it's even better. That's a good observation. Now you got a 10% return if you pay 450, right? Now we can we can also then we can also then right say we could use. I'm hoping there's nothing there's nothing funky in here, right? So we could we could um, So we could do goal C. We could do goal C. We could definitely do this. We could say data. We could say we could say change this value. We could say change this value to 15%, right? By changing the purchase price, right? Boom. So we pay 318 for we get a 15% return. So we definitely use goal C for that, right? Okay, so the question is, is can we build a data table to, uh, do what's, cap rates? What's the purpose of this spreadsheet right here? Who asked me that? I did. Like, a student sent it to me, he wants, he looks, looking at 10, 10 apartments and he wants to know if it's a good return, a good investment or not. Oh, do you want to know if it's a good investment or if it's a good spreadsheet, I suppose? No, the question is if it's a good investment. Oh. I'm not grading this, if it's a good investment or not, right? So this is the going in cap rate. Um,
think I'm going to be able to get this. I'd have to give this some thought to how we can do a data table to make this. <coughs> I'd have to give some thought on how I can do a data table. That's not going to work this way. How to do a data table so that I can figure out what cap rate I should pay in order to get a particular return. That's really the way to do it. I can't just say, you know, what cap rate. What I can do is say, I can set it up in a way to say, at different purchase prices, what IRR do I get? So I can play with the purchase price, and as a consequence, when we do the two-dimensional one, I can see what the going in cap rate is. So I'll build on that um, next week. Okay. Can you do reverse? Can you do it reverse? Like do a little formula that puts in the IRR that you give you the Yeah, we can do that. We just did goal seek for that, or we could do or we could do a data table where we can point to the IRR, right? So we could we could definitely point to the IRR, right? Now the question is, is what variable do we want to change here? So we can change the purchase price, right? So we can make this at 400, at 500, right? At 600. If that's what you were, if that's what you meant, James? No, you're putting a. Uh, if you do like a target IRR. Yeah, we did that already. The values. Yeah, we did that. We did like targeted 15% and it brought the purchase price down to three. But it wasn't a data table. So I'm just saying, how can we do a data table? So I can say, I can say, what if goal seek, and so let's set, um, uh, Now hold on. Yeah, it doesn't work. It, maybe the plumbing's not set up. Let, I'll set this up. I'll set this up for next week or the following week when we do the two-dimensional data table. Okay? Okay. So, so the real question or the real issue here is, is what I wanted to bring out here was we got to have terminal value. We got to have terminal value, otherwise it's very difficult to get a realistic IRR. Now that we've got an IRR, we can compare that to our weighted average cost of capital. And as long as that IRR is higher than our weighted average cost of capital, the implication it being that we have a net present value of greater than one, then we're ready to go. Okay? Make sense? Okay, questions? Yes, Cole. One more time. Can you just... So if net present value is going up, then what happens to the return on your IRR? Okay. If net present value is going up, your IRR has to be going up. Because net present value is the point at which your I I'm sorry, IRR is 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 the discount rate at which your net present value is zero. Okay? So that means, and I've always done the example, right? If 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 my discount rate is six percent right? My IRR should be 6% at a net present value of zero. So you can always prove IRR by doing net present value and using the IRR as your discount. If net present value is greater than zero, your IRR has to be higher than your discount rate. And the higher the MPV goes, the higher the IRR. So they're positively related. Okay, let's take a break, and when we come back, you're going to have an assignment that we're going to do in class uh, on your desk, and you're going to have your computers, and I'll be able to walk around and help you with it. But it'll be, but it'll be for submitting today.
concept is, is in the year in which I revert the building, I get the cash flow from the building, plus I get the sales value from the building. So that's why you have all that cash flow in that particular year. Isabel, show me. Yes, Kenny. Oh, well, but she's been asking for a while. All right. Okay, but you, you have to you have to plug it in. No, it's already plugged in. Is this your brand or something? No. What am I looking for? Oh. I'm like. It's coming. You know, come down. Oh. Yeah, just a minute. <laughs> I'm, I'm almost done. It's just three things that I'm missing. I'm, 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 I'm through. You can go and point because I sent the first. Oh. Because you sent the what? I took away points. Because um, I made a mistake. Um, I sent you the, 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 my last answer that I sent you. I put in the, the, the five year plan. I thought we were building it two, five year, ten year. I but I, I have to take a look at what I, I, I don't think I specifically said I took points off because of that. But I, I don't think you sent it. That's what it was, because I don't remember all 20 assignments. but. You might not have sent me the one of ten. You might have sent me one of five. Okay, so you've got circular formulas in there which are going to mess things up. Okay, all right. So what is your question? Okay, first, my NPV is not looking. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. Show me what you're pointing to. Just, just do it all over again. Just do one PV. Here, let's prove something. Let's prove something. Get, get away from here. Just go over here and do one PV there. Use, 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 you should have a mouse. Use, use the discount rate. I'm sorry, use the IRR. Yeah. Comma. You go to your cash flow, yep. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. No, there. Okay, so it, it, it's good. It's good. At, at this rate, it's good, right? Okay. The net present value using your IRR as a discount rate gives you a, a net present value of zero. So that works there. Now, come over here and redo the formula. So, Just redo it. Just do it from scratch. Let's open up the bracket. Right, go to right. Go all the way down. Show me where you're pointing to. No, your That's discount rate. Okay, because this is in the in the video you didn't do it, so I was trying to point out. The discount rate. The discount rate. Oh. That's the weighted average cost of capital. See. If you look at the video, but don't look at the previous video where the concepts are explained, then you can make those mistakes. Because all you're doing is copying my keystrokes, but you don't understand why I'm pointing there. No, I know. Because we're using weighted average cost of capital as our formula for calculating the discount rate. Right. And then, comma, no. Wait. 
there, comma. You need to get a mouse, Isabel. I know. There you go. Now close it. Hit enter. Why why I did it with you and it did? Right. It's not fair. It's the same thing I did. <laughs> it's the same thing I <laughs> Okay, and then this is my second one. Okay. Last night for some reason I did the first because it was fine and I equaled it perfectly. For some reason when I was trying to do the you know, when we um You're doing rent growth, what's that pointing to there? Okay, for some reason when I <laughs> um, Supposed to yeah, but show, show me what you're pointing to. Okay, here, right? No, <laughs> not there. Above it. The one above you're it. Okay. This is this is fine. I'm I'm going to this cell right there. Oh, okay, okay. What's in that cell? I messed up in the. Of course you messed up. But I can't reverse it. I can't find a way to take it off. Delete this. I know. I know. I've been trying to do that. Ah, uh, get a mouse. Can you get a mouse? No. <laughs> Come on, Professor. We just, you know, I do this in between work. You don't have time. You don't have a whole setup for it. Uh, it's not a. It's, yeah, it keeps saying this part. I can't change the detail. I don't know why. I don't know why I did wrong. I changed that after. Yes, I can't get away. Okay, here. Hold on. 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 What's this? Watch, watch, watch. Okay. Hey, uh, who's there? No, I've got a question. So, when you're dragging on, like, for example, this. Um, okay, just get it out. On, like, for example, like the vacancy collection loss, right? Over six because years. You hold on, hold on, hold on. How do you? Okay. Oh, okay. For example, on the okay, now do it. Uh, you, go like some you see, you did that, but you paused your video times, like, and you went and do right? it, and then. So no, I didn't do anything yes, like yes, that. Yes, yes, I didn't do not yes, that yes, one. Yes, not that. No, yes, yes, not that. Okay. Yes, yes, but once you reference it, so how do you do that? Of course, I make mistakes. I know. I just don't make mistakes. So, like with the money side, when you did this one, yeah, in with Mac, just press Command T. Five point seven. Mac. Oh, let me show you. Yeah. I used the formula. I actually used the data. I did use the data. Yeah. After you reference the cell, press command. I understand what he's doing. I understand the concept. Yeah, and then you can drag it. Yeah. It just told me off going. Okay. Okay. That's what I need to do now. Yeah. Well, you've got the same, yeah, but why? Well, did you look at the formulas? Yeah, they seem right. Do you know what I was going to say about it? What's K62? Can you help me with this? Yeah, you want to come? Yeah, everything, everything is correct. I'm not in case 62. Do you see how I got the present value? I used the old school. Form. But then I get this. That's fine. So do you know how to get it directly yeah. with the people? What, what, what is this formula? The rate here is. But you're, you're growing stuff, right? Is that the, you're growing at a rate? Yeah. Why aren't you? Why aren't you? Why aren't you fixing it? Why aren't you anchoring it to the to the rate? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay, listen. So listen. I'm on two X the whole time. You you've got you got an hour and fifteen minutes at four twenty. At four twenty, uh, you need to send your assignments in now. You're gonna see that this is I wanna give you this is essentially the same thing I did in the video that you guys have been following along, but you're gonna do it in class. I'm available. 
I will not teach things that are in the video. I will not teach things that are in the video. But I will, if you've got, got problems, I'll come by and say, hey, let me see it. I'll try to work through problems with you. Does that make sense? And, and, and what I'll do is I'll put a similar thing up on the board. If you want to hear it, and I'll explain it you know, to other people, I'll explain it. And if not, you're going ahead. But I'm available. I'm available. I'm here. But I want to see you all working on these things, OK? So, so that um, we get practice in class. Unfettered, no work, no phones, no dogs running around, no children throwing balls, no wives yelling at us, no husbands screaming, no maids walking around with noise, you know, with vacuum cleaners, OK? You'll see it's very, very similar to, you'll see that it's very similar, but why don't you read it first because it's not exactly the same thing. So there are some slight nuances to it, okay, but you're going to see that it's very, very similar to what we did in the video. James, here you go. Alec? Johnson. Did you see where the big arrow was on the thing? Yeah. But you see, it kind of yeah. makes sense now. You didn't have, you didn't get, but I'm saying in the other mm -hmm. one. Yeah, because you gotta have, you got, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta revert. Here you go, Kenny. You gotta revert. Well, when I talk about perpetuity, at a certain point in the cash flow, once you've got it stabilized, there is a value to that stream, to that constant growth stream. So that present value at a particular point in time is what that cap rate was, what that capitalization is. So, so the assumption is in year 10, this thing is not only worth the cash flow you get that year, whether you sell it or not, you're assuming you sell it. Hey, 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 guys, hey, these are individual assignments. These are not group projects. And you can use your shells. If you've already worked on this, you can use your shells. It's, it's pretty practical, actually. Um, so, what... I guess my only question would have been like, where would you, where would you come up with the sum for that tenth year to add on? To it? You know what I mean? Like, like well, what? So, so you need. So, I mean, this is where you know you need to have looked at the video, right? Sure. But ultimately, it's what I was doing there now. You, you've got to create an eleventh year so that you can capitalize that that rate in the eleventh year and add it to your tenth year cash flow. Guys, you got to create another year, mm -hmm. yeah. capitalize that in a Y, and then add it to that cash flow for that year. Yeah. Okay? Yes, Thank <laughs> you. 
So the depreciation expense is new, so does that go up at the top, no, no. like in the rental incomes? Because we didn't have depreciation expense before. Well, so if it's an expense, would it go where income is? Well, vacancy and collection oh, loss yeah, does, and that's the that. percentage of PGI, and that's the only one that's also percentage of PGI. So following that, I would assume that it goes to the top. Like the way you move it, you could Okay, but if it's you just, let's let's go a little more basic than that. It's no, depreciation and expense, right. it no. wouldn't go with income. No. So because vacancy is not really a loss, but like a pseudo loss, it goes up there. But it, it's not our expense. It's like more of a missed opportunity than an expense. Yeah, okay, but, but so, yeah, but depreciation and expense. Right, would go down. So what is, but what is depreciation? Loss of value. Okay. Or at least like, uh, so th think, think through a little bit whether that's a cash item or not, and what goes exactly. it. What goes into NOI and what doesn't go into NOI? And difference is, what does NOI <coughs> bear in 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 REITs? And why why do REITs have a particular calculation? You know what? And, and there's a whole explanation I gave one day on EBITDA and how EBITDA approximated NOI. <laughs> Think about all those things before you build it in there, okay? Okay. And then ask me again before you get to work. Okay, yeah, it's fine. It, 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 it works. It's, it's, uh, I, I saw this last night with the template. So, I just didn't think it was just Okay, so. Okay, well, how can you test it? How can you test if it's right? So, make, make a percentage so that it's easier to read. Because otherwise, all you're doing is plugging numbers in, right? And then we, we can't fix it. Okay. So you got to have, have to have a steady state, right? Is your formatting right there, by the way? No, no it is. Do you put dollar sign on everything? Do you put double oh, underscoring? Okay. Do you put do you put double underscoring on everything? No, I guess not. And you wouldn't even put it on the last one. No, that's not general or numbers. 
go to comp. Just go to comp. Just go to comp. There you go. Get rid of the patch. You got three non percent Are your formulas right? Did you check so. these formulas? Did you, think? Did you check all these formulas? I checked them with the first video. Yeah. Oh, they're not. not. So there's nothing wrong there. Did you, did you do your check? Did you check it at 40% of that? So these 
So you should need a six. Yeah, it, it, um, the weighted average coupon is 6%, not 0.6%, okay? It's 6%. 6%, not 0.6%, okay? I just saw it. okay? And then, so as it goes through, and it asks about the cap rate, so before you had a broken entry and exit cap rate, mm -hmm. and so now you broke it, the entry and exit cap rate was pulled based on if I just pull precedence. Um, well, don't, don't pull precedence, think. Well, no, I'm just saying, I don't recall no, if no, this think, No, no, one think, forget two. precedence, okay. think. How do you calculate cap rate? The WAC divided by the increase in rates. Not WAC. What did the textbook define it as? Um, value, NOI, revenue? No. What? We, we use WAC for what? Average cost of capital. No, that's what it's defined. What do we use it for? Discount rate, cost of capital, discount rate. So what did the book define <coughs> exit cap or cap rates as? Repeat? This, um, discount rate minus the growth rate. There we go. Okay, so what's your question now? Discount rate plus growth rate. So forget the precedence. Forget mimicking the formula you had there. Let's think how we get to these things. So cap rate is discount rate plus growth rate. Okay, so what's your question? So this is, okay, so I did that. So then now the question is, do I just make that point that you find higher? I don't know, what is, it, what is the instructions? I don't remember the instructions. Well, it's asking, I, this was last uh, time okay. I it's asking that. for the exit cap is greater by 25 bits. So it is like equals, or whoops, wrong one. Equals this. You sure you're reading that right? Well, one bit would be point zero zero. No. What are you calculating first? Chase? I'm going in. Cap rate is greater than the exit cap rate, so I'm just trying to find the difference between the inter cap rate and the exit cap rate. Okay. You're you're you're, you're okay. Then I'm not trying to criticize you. No, it's okay. you're you're mimicking stuff. You're not thinking. Right. Stand up. This is one my recommendation to you. Stand up. Okay. Go outside. All right. Walk and say, what am I trying to calculate here? And then come back and ask me the same question. But I'm on. Uh, just listen to my suggestion. No, I'm listening. I'm telling you I don't think it's going to work. Okay. Well, then, then just do whatever you're doing. But I'm doing the wrong thing. Yeah, you are. Right. You, you had a question, Cole? No, I did not. It's telling you too bad. I mean, you're, mirror, you're just trying to mirror things. Well, mirror. no, because you didn't have an entry and exit cap rate before, okay. read. so it's not a mirror. Read. Read. I read. Read. I find out the hiccup. The hiccup was because we changed the IR, the, the number from 5% to 6% of the vacancy collection loss, but we're looking at the vacancy thing. That was why. Okay. 
vacancy doesn't change. That's growth. And that's growth. Yeah, but not vacancy doesn't change. So that's only one case. case. So that's the but there's case. you have a problem okay. somewhere in your problem. Yeah. There's definitely a problem of consistency that yeah. something's not carrying across. So utilities. Work on the rest of the plumbing on this first, and then we'll come back to that. Okay. There's a problem. It's got to be a simple problem like this. This one there, I just fixed that one, but it didn't fix the problem. You understand what I'm saying? Because that one you were pointing to. You were pointing to that. Yeah. Which you really should just everything should point there, but that still didn't fix this. Okay. And it should have. Work on the rest of the spreadsheet. Don't waste any more time on that. Okay. Chase, did you get to my question? Uh, absolutely not. No? No. Discount rate deducted by the increase in growth. Just discount rate was growth? Yes. Okay. So what is the case telling you to do? What is it telling you? What is it telling you? What does it tell you? What does the case tell you? In terms of cap rate, that the, inner cap, the going in cap rate is greater by 0.25% than the exit cap rate. Ask me a question. No videos. You should have, you know. I saw the videos. It's just the best. 
I just thought the way I phrased it sequentially had to calculate the other one first, but it doesn't matter. Gotcha. I think it's better.
if there's a problem here or somewhere in the flow here. This has to flow from that, okay, so this has to be <coughs> Six percent, seven point eight, right? So why don't you just go and hit ten four six? Six. And then that gives you a seven point eight. So now you got it working. And so what what I what you had to fix and what I wanted to be saying is it doesn't like formulas there, it likes numbers. Okay? And then this has to be a summation of that it's got to flow. Okay? Thank Does that work? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Can you give me a discount rate to, to match my mean average so you, can't, you can't take your discount rate? I mean, I mean my IRR, my internal rate of return, to match my average. And then I can't Did take you get this to add to equal to what? To the 7.6. It doesn't, it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to? That's not because you've got a positive MPV. Now, you can check. Right, you can. No, oh, if there's no way to check, you can go and say. MPV, right. Right, and your MPV, if your rate is A, right, and your flow is that, I lose 100. 